Okay, should we get going? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, hi everybody. It's going to be a slightly long presentation, but I'll try to wrap it up uh, as soon as uh, we possibly can. And feel free to interrupt uh, whenever you have questions and we'll, we'll take them. Yeah. Uh, cool. So, we'll be doing species, uh, species delimitation using molecular phylogenetic methods today, uh, primarily because yesterday we spoke about coalescent and uh, incomplete lenient sorting and all of that. So uh, today we have a few more slides on, on, on those topics. So we thought it might just be a good, good continuation of yesterday's, uh, uh, yesterday's uh, uh, you know, uh, session. Uh, so we'll have character evolution tomorrow, uh, which is supposed to be today. All right, so let's get this on the road. <clears throat> So delimiting species using molecular phylogenetic methods uh, is actually a misnomer. So what this presentation should read is delimiting genetic structure using molecular phylogenetic methods. Uh, because as you will see, uh, you know, while the presentation is going on, that the word species has uh, uh, a more profound meaning than just, uh, you know, uh, just delimiting genetic structure, right? Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll get there when we get there over the presentation. So the bottom line here is that remember that all of these tools that we use for species delimitation, they actually delimit genetic structure and they don't really delimit species as we know them. All right. <clears throat> okay. So this is uh, a broad outline of the talk, uh, doesn't really matter. Um, so why do we have to bother with species delimitation, right? So there are there are practical reasons why we should we should worry about species about delimiting species, primarily because we can tell if 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 we do delimitations right, we can tell useful species from harmful species, which is very essential for our own survival as as uh, as human beings, and we can also define and identify potentially endangered or you know uh, threatened species, and uh, you know try and save them from uh, <clears throat> going extinct, right? So delimiting species is, I think, we all believe is the bedrock of, of conservation itself. And that, that is precisely why it is uh, very important. <clears throat> there are a few philosophical reasons as well. So stuff like, you know, our species real, our higher tax are real and so on and so forth, but we'll not get into a philosophical conversation today. We just stick to the practical one, right? <clears throat> So to give you an example, uh, here are two seemingly uh, similar looking plants and uh, uh, people could have easily, you know, called them the same species. However, uh, when proper delimitation was applied to these, uh, to this group of plants, the one on the left, which is the common hogweed, it's a native species to Western Europe. And it's a very helpful species in the sense it, it, it uh, uh, it's used in like, you know, remedies and other traditional recipes and so on, very much like uh, some of how the Indian native plants are being used. And the one on the right is the giant hogweed, which is not native to Western Europe. It, it comes from the Caucasus. <clears throat> and it also is possibly carcinog uh, carcinogenic and causes blisters and so on, right? So this is a very simple practical example of why we have to distinguish between uh, you know, harmful and harmless, uh, harmful and useful species. Uh, and uh, this is where delimitation comes uh, into play. Another example closer to home, uh, in fact, uh, our friend and one of our participants, Anuj, had written an article about this. Um, so there is this uh, species of frog uh, called uh, the fungoid frog, right? Uh, its scientific name is Hydrophylax malabaricus, if I'm not right. If I'm not wrong, and this fungoid frog was was thought to be very widespread, and recently people worked on this group and uh, did some species delimitation, and they uh, described a new species called the widespread fungoid frog, frog or Hydrophylax bahuvistara. Now it's found that this Hydrophylax bahuvistara secretes a certain peptide uh, called urumin, which 
supposedly has you know anti antibacterial and antiviral properties which the other species uh, malabarica doesn't have so you know so these are some uh, cool examples of uh, how species help us you know how and, and how delimitation is pretty important right cool <clears throat> so you see these four uh, very similar looking toads right uh, superficial they all look very similar they've got granular skin they've got like a uh, like a you know prominent tympanum and warts and ridges everywhere um, so all these four species uh, all, all these four toads are in fact four different species right so if you had not done species delimitation we would have considered all these toads to be part of the same population right and we would we would have completely ignored the fact that uh, the one on the top right is just endemic to the Western Ghats, while the one on the left is very widely distributed across the, all over India and Southeast Asia. And similarly, if you look at the one on the bottom right, <clears throat> uh, that is Datta Frinus bedomai, it is highly range restricted. It's, it's restricted to just three mountain ranges uh, in uh, in Kudremukh, Ponmudi, and Kalakkar. Right. So you know it's 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 a it's a highly endangered toad species, which which needs uh, very concerted conservation action. So, if we consider all these toads as one population, then we would have not bothered about uh, you know an animal like the Tathafrinus bedomai, and that would, that could have easily gone extinct, right? So, this is another important part of species delimitation, where it kind of informs uh, conservation on which species have to be acted on uh, on an urgent on, on on an immediate basis, right? <clears throat> okay, moving on. What are species, right? Um, <clears throat> I think there are about 30 different species concepts, which means the word species has, in fact, 30 different uh, definitions, if you, if, if you will, right? So in general, if a certain concept has 30 different definitions, what does that usually mean? Can someone answer? It's probably an invalid concept. Uh, it's not really invalid because all these concepts are really thought out, and uh, uh, you know, it's not really invalid. I mean, the the fact that there are thirty different definitions for what a species could be tells us that we really don't understand what species are, right? Uh, we, we we don't have a you know clear formal understanding of what species really are. Uh, Species are basically, you know, buckets into which we have decided to put uh, organisms based on our convenience, right? Um, <clears throat> so one of the first species concepts, uh, there are 30 concepts, but I'm just going to go through three or four or maybe five of them uh, and not in great details. So the first, one of the first concepts was by, uh, was, was propounded by uh, Carolus Linne, which is the phenetic concept or the typological concept. And he said that a group of individuals differ from other groups by possessing constant diagnostic characters, right? And uh, he actually encouraged uh, defining species and describing describing them based on a type specimen or a type series for each species, right? And that's one of the reasons this concept is also called the typological concept, right? So this is a completely morphology or phonetics based uh, view of of uh, the, the idea of species, right? And as we all know, there are various problems with just using morphology. Now, how do you deal with polymorphism within populations? There is this crazy frog in the Western Guards called Rauchester's bedomai. I, 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 uh, I think some of you would uh, have heard of this. Bedome's bush frog or something. It looks very different in, so any hill range you go to, there are populations of Rauchester's bedomai in the Southern Western Guards and they all look very distinct. So just based on uh, polymer, uh, just based on morphology, you would call them various species, right? Not just not just one. <clears throat> Similarly, there are, like I said, there are geographic variations amongst populations. And what do you do now with uh, cryptic species? Right? Cryptic. Uh, we, we we have today come to uh, find out that a lot of the widespread uh, 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 species, uh, which we all thought were you know a singular species across their range, uh, they all are uh ending up as species complexes or cryptic species 
right? Uh, Calotus versicolor is a great example, and Dravidogecko is a great example. So these are species where you cannot really tell them apart by morphology unless you, you know, examine them really hard. Superficially, they all look the same, but in fact, they have been, you know, isolated. Populations have been isolated from each other for for a very long time, uh, you know, making them different species and so on. <clears throat> How do you deal with convergence, right? If, if you're just using the phonetic concept of species, dealing with convergence again becomes a problem. Right. So there could be two organisms that are not really related by ancestry and descent, but they could look very similar because of uh, because they've been acted on by very similar ecological forces. Right. Uh, so convergence, again, is a huge problem. You cannot you know, you cannot quantify convergence just based on the phonetic concept. Yeah. <clears throat> OK, so moving on. Next was the biological species concept propounded by uh, Dobzhansky and Meyer. Uh, this is, I think, the species concept that is taught in every 12th standard biology book or maybe even earlier. It basically says that, uh, you know, uh, species are reproductively isolated populations, you know. Uh, and uh, because of reproductive isolation, they start evolving differently and therefore they become different species. So that's basically the idea. The problem with the biological species concept is evident, right? So what do you do with asexual species, right? And moreover, how do you test reproductive isolation, right? It is very hard to test and very hard to prove that two populations are in fact different species because they are reproductively isolated. And uh, reproductive isolation, again, is often incomplete because, you know, as we all know, there are, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of hybridization that happens in nature, right? So just because there are two different species that are reproducing and producing viable offspring, it does not take away from the fact that those two parents are in fact distinct species, right? So reproductive isolation is often incomplete and it does not account for hybridization in nature. Okay. <clears throat> the next concept is the ecological concept uh, by this guy uh, Van Valen. Um, I forget his first name. Uh, he was an evolutionary biologist and uh, uh, he suggested that organisms occupying different ecological niches are different species, right? Well, the problem with this approach is that uh, uh, like ecological niche cannot be an exclusive diagnostic of a species, right? Um, and also uh, the fact that Within one species, there could be different races that prefer different ecological niches, right? So that that's one of the problems with one of the major problems with Van Valen's uh, theory. Um, interestingly, Van Valen also propounded the Red Queen hypothesis in evolutionary biology. Uh, do you guys know the Red Queen hypothesis? I guess not. There are a few. There's one yes in the chat. Yeah, so they can just unmute and unmute and feel free to talk. Yes. I think most of us are not aware of it. Okay. Okay, so uh, that's a nice, that's an interesting side story, right? So the Red Queen hypothesis comes from Alice in Wonderland, okay, uh, written by Lewis Carroll. Now, in uh, in the sequel to Alice in Wonderland, this book called Through the Looking Glass, uh, you know, Alice is with the Red Queen and she's in you know in, in that strange land down the rabbit hole and all that. And uh, in this strange land, there is this running race that happens, and Alice and Red the Red Queen are trying to participate in this running race, right? And uh, Alice notices that, that they are running really fast, both the Red Queen and Alice. They are running at breakneck speed and in fact Alice is really trying hard to catch up. But she also notices that though they are running really hard, they are not, they're not really going from place to place. They are actually standing in the same place, right? Uh, nothing has changed. The, the trees that she sees, the buildings, and they are all basically constant, though they are running at breakneck speed. So she actually asks the Red Queen, she says, hey, you know, <clears throat> where I come from, which is basically the world as we know it, 
uh, if we run this fast, we'd be getting from point A to point B, right? So how come in, in, in your land, uh, you know, we, we don't seem to be moving at all? So the Red Queen replies to Alice and says, <clears throat> oh, well, if you're getting from point A to point B at this speed in your world, you know, it might, might must be a really slow world, you know? In my land, uh, you have to run as fast as you can to be able to stay in the same place, right? And in my land, if you want to get from point A to point B, you need to run twice as fast as what we are doing right now, right? So that basically is what the Red Queen said to Alice in, in uh, uh, through the Looking Glass, and Van Valen basically adapted that uh, adapted that idea into evolutionary biology to say that you know uh, organisms need to adapt to uh, you know to a rapidly changing environment to be able to survive, you know. And this Red Queen hypothesis is also used in chaos theory and uh, astronomy and a lot of other things. So Lewis Carroll was basically a cat. You know, he was he was always on drugs, but he was a cat. And uh, so, if you haven't read Alice in Wonderland, you should absolutely go read it because a lot of these hidden gems in that book. And uh, if you have read it, I, I'd recommend that you go reread it and find a lot of these hidden gems. Right. So yeah, that's like a slight digression I wanted to make for the presentation. Okay. Uh, so moving on, we have the evolutionary species concept. Right. Uh, the guy in the bottom picture, though, he looks a lot like the guy who, uh, you know, founded Kentucky Fried Chicken. Uh, he's not. Uh, he's a guy called George Simpson. And he propounded the evolutionary species, species concept, which says that species are lineages that are evolving separately from others with their own unitary evolutionary roles and tendencies. Right. So the problems with this concept is that you really cannot define independent roles and tendencies and you really can't. And George Simpson does not provide a mechanism to test what he's saying, right? So it's re really difficult to follow this concept. However, to give him due credit, he's the first guy to actually consider species as a lineage, right? Which is what we all believe today, that, that species are independently evolving lineages. <clears throat> okay. And George Simpson was, uh, you know, a paleontologist, and he came up with this theory primarily for uh, some of the fossils that he found, and so on. Right. Then we have the phylogenetic species concept. So the phylogenetic species concept is very simple. It just says the smallest diagnostic monophyletic group of populations within which there is a parent, a parental pattern of ancestry and descent, is a species. Right. So, in essence, what Eldridge and Carcraft are saying is that if there are two groups that are related, but they're reciprocally monophyletic, then those two groups should be considered different species, right? Uh, the problem with just arriving at monophyly is what characters, uh, what character or subset of characters do you use to build a tree that would give you monophyly? Uh, that would give you reciprocal monophyly, right? Uh, so, for instance, a set of characters A could make species 1 and 2 mono, uh, reciprocally monophyletic. But if you use a different set of characters B, they might not be monophyletic. They might actually be paraphyletic, right? So, what characters do you use? And, uh, and how do you deal with reciprocal monophyly at the population level? So, for instance, let's assume you've, you've sampled many individuals from one population, evidently belonging to one species, you build a tree, you would still see that because of the genetic structure in this population, uh, there will be certain individuals that cluster together as, 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 as a monophyletic group, right? And there'll be certain other individuals that cluster together, but that does not make them distinct species, right? So where do you draw the line? So that's another problem with just following the phylogenetic concept. And again, there is this minor problem of gene trees versus species trees, which turns out to be not so minor, in fact. So, for example, like we, we were talking yesterday about the same problem and Praveen was discussing, discussing incomplete linear sorting and so on. Well, if you use a certain gene to build a tree, there could be two species that are reciprocally monophyletic. But if you use a, if you use a completely different gene, they might not be monophyletic. They might, they might actually be uh, paraphyletic, right? Species A could be paraphyletic with respect to species B. So these are some of the problems with the phylogenetic concept. Okay. Okay. So, Hello. Chaitanya. Yeah. 
Uh, can you elaborate more about the uh, reciprocal monophyly? I don't think I completely understood that. Okay. So, uh, let's say there are two groups, uh, uh, species for, 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 for uh, convenience, let's say one is species A and the other is species B, right? And let's sample a certain, let's sample organisms from both groups and, and, and use uh, a single gene to build a tree. Okay. Now, if all organisms of species A uh, are monophyletic, which means all organisms of species A have an immediate common ancestor, okay, and all organisms of species B have an immediate common ancestor, right, you can now say that species A and B are reciprocally monophyletic. Right. However, if there are certain individuals in species A that actually, actually, branch with or clade with species B, right, then these two species are not reciprocally monophyletic. They are in fact paraphyletic. Did you know? Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, John Weens was, uh, John Weens basically consolidated all these different species concepts and so did decoyeros. Uh, and they basically came up with the idea that, uh, you know, there is a general agreement amongst all participants, participants in the sense, all the people who propounded species concepts, that species are lineages, right? And all the, all the other concepts that we have seen, like the biological concept, the phylogenetic concept, the phenotypical or the, or the typological concept, all these concepts are in fact sub processes that collaborate uh, uh, along this whole road to speciation, right? So, Weens and Dequeiro has basically told us to view species as lineages, which keep, uh, you know, lineages on which these sub-processes keep acting, you know, over time, okay? So, and today this is the most widely accepted uh, kind of consolidation of all these concepts that you know species are independently evolving lineages that could show you know you know phenetic divergence that could show that that could be reproductively isolated and so on and so forth yeah the next slide will explain that a little better <clears throat> so under all concepts a species is a separately evolving popular uh, metapopulation lineage right so that is the most widely accepted concept of a species today right and while it is a separately evolving lineage, uh, this lineage could also be reproductively isolated, right? Which means it's conforming to the biological species concept. And the species could be occupying a completely different niche from all the other members of the genus, right? Which means it's kind of adhering to the ecological species concept. And similarly, it could be mor morphologically diagnosable from the other uh, congeners. And it could be, you know, if you look at it phylogenetically, it, it could represent a uh, uh, a monophyletic group, right? So, <clears throat> the idea here is that species are independently evolving lineages and all the other concepts are basically sub-processes that kind of play a part in uh, being able to diagnose the species from all the other uh, all the other lineages in that group, right? So, if we have to diagrammatically represent what we just said, uh, look at this tree on your right, right? So initially you have a single population or a lineage and then at some point there is a there is a phylogenetic split right and this split causes one lineage to become the black species and one lineage to become a white the white species right and somewhere along the line uh, over time you see that all the other sub processes are acting on 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 basically this uh, these these two metapopulations or, or these two lineages, right? So the idea here is that, so SC1 that you see here could be one of uh, one of the sub-processes, like let's say at, at, at time where SC1 is acting, uh, these two species, these, the, uh, these two populations could have become reproductively isolated, right? And somewhere around uh, SC4, uh, they could be so reproductively isolated that they are, you know, uh, uh, reciprocally monophyletic, right? And somewhere around SC9, they could be, you know, phenetically or, or morphologically 
completely diagnosable from each other, right? So that is the fundamental idea. And remember that it's not always in this order that these things happen. Uh, <clears throat> for example, morphological divergence could happen earlier, and then there could be genetic divergence, right? Or you know, these two different lineages could start occupying different niches first, and therefore you know, morphological divergence happens a little later, and then much much later you have genetic divergence, right? And, uh, and in fact, you get reciprocal monophyle. Uh, the point here is that uh, if you look at where I'm pointing to, uh, along the stem of this Y, you can very confidently call this whole population as one species, right? And along the two forks of this Y, where you have the black and white, you can very confidently say that these two lineages represent two, two distinct species because they've kind of, you know, uh, diverged so much from each other that they probably have different niches, they are reproductively isolated, you know, reciprocally monophyletic and so on. But there is this little gray area in between when the process of speciation is actually happening, right? And when you sample, when you as a field biologist go and sample two lineages that are somewhere in this gray area, that is when all our problems arise, right? Do we call them two species? Because Certain aspects are very distinct, right? For example, morphologically, they could be very distinct. Ecologically, they, they could be occupying distinct niches. But genetically, they could be very similar, right? So such organisms fall in this gray zone. And a lot of the times we found that when, when, when we are, you know, uh, working on you know, organisms, we find that most of them kind of inhabit this little uh, gray area here, right? So this is the fundamental conundrum with uh, being able to delimit species. Okay, so does anyone have questions on this uh, slide? <clears throat> uh, so Chaitanya, yeah, uh, yeah. in the gray zone, we should consider them as one species or two species, then different species? That's the million dollar question, right? <laughs> and and that's, that's the question that we all grapple with. If you had a simple answer, I wouldn't be making this presentation in the first place, right? Okay. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, and, and but but what you can do is you can you can try and kind of uh, mitigate uh, this confusion. Uh, in, the, in the rest of the slides, uh, right? how it is different from Simpson's idea of uh, uh, evolutionary species? Because here also we are considering lineages, right? Um, yeah, but Simpson never gave us a mechanism to test. Right? He just said that species are evolutionarily independent. And he didn't even say that you could test that phylogenetically. Right? Uh, so he just said species have uh, are, are evolutionarily, evolutionarily independent lineages. But Beans and Dequeros actually consolidated all of this and said, this is how you, know, you, uh, you treat these lineages. And this is how you account for the possibility that all the other sub-processes are acting on these two lineages to make them diagnosable from each other. Right, so that's how it's different. Okay. Hello. Chaitanya, there are questions in the, uh, the chat box. Okay. Um, Shruti says, can that gray area be called a subspecies? Uh, we'll not get into that because, I mean, I, this is just my personal opinion. I don't think subspecies exist, right? Uh, it, they are either species or they're not. You know, yes. and, and and I, I, uh, it's like being pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not. Uh, you know, and and I, I really don't understand the concept of subspecies. So let's not go there. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, can, I, can I just quickly? Uh, so sorry, go 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 ahead. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, there's other uh, connecting question. Islands are such gray areas, gray zones. She's asking. Question mark. Priyanka. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, Priyanka, you can, Priyanka, you can ask him directly. Uh, so, hey Chaitanya, when you said gray zones, right? Like as a field biologist, when you go and pick up samples from certain locations, and that's where you, I mean, that gray zones are. Um, so, so this I, gray zone is not in terms of landscape. This gray zone is in terms of evolutionary time, right? Right. So, right. If, okay. if you're sampling species in this in, in, at, at at a time when they've just recently diverged from each other. Mm -hmm. Then you have a problem, right? You well, certain certain aspects to the species' biology have been established, while certain other aspects are still, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know they, 
they're still fixing uh, in in those lineages, right? Right. Okay. Got it. Right. Got it. Yeah. Uh, Chetanya, I just wanted to quickly add uh, to what Neha had uh, mentioned, um, and also uh, Sujata. Um, so, if we go by the definition that Kevin De Quiras has come up with for for a species, he calls it you know separately evolving metapopulation lineages, and uh, then he goes on to say that you know all these other species concepts are sub processes that basically you know are pointing at the same separately evolving metapopulation lineages. So for a pair for you know a, 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 a putative pair of uh, species if you have evidence for any one of these processes then you can call them separate species right so if there is evidence that there is um, um, uh, reproductive isolation you can call them two separate species or there is some evidence of morphological divergence you can call them two separate species so if you uh, so uh, in that sense uh, <clears throat> Uh, Kevin Decker has uh, actually comes up with the criteria also for species delimitation, whereas uh, Simpson didn't have a criteria for species delim uh, delimitation. Now, this also means that uh, uh, what Kevin uh, is proposing basically then throws out the subspecies concept, because as long as there's you know evidence from any one of these uh, older species delimitation. Um, I mean, uh, older species concepts. You can call them two separate species, right? Okay. So that's that's where we stand right now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Just, uh, I mean, just a question uh, to what Praveen said. If 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 we consider that, then the gray area is not so much of a problem, because at least there would be at least one of those, uh, you know, older definitions that would be valid uh, in the gray area for it to exist as a gray area. Yes, you're, you're right. I mean, if we go by Kevin Decora's uh, uh, definition and his criteria for species delimitation, then yes, that gray area can be considered in the gray area. We can consider two separate species. Yeah, based on one line of evidence, uh, just one line of evidence, right? But I think uh, in a later paper, Kevin Decora also uh, says that it would be great if you have at least three lines of evidence to be able to say these two lineages are distinct species. Um, uh, you know, so it's 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 uh, it's still work in progress, and and I think uh, the discretion of the biologist is of absolute importance before you know considering two lineages as as distinct species, right? So, Chaitanya, even I had a question. Hello. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, your uh, if if we know that, yeah, I think are the are the. Uh, our species which we are working on is in the gray zone is is there any way that uh, we know that we are in uh, in the level of sc3 or we are in the level of sc8 or something like that no Do don't know? don't take this diagram literally right okay so this is not uh, this is not representative of what exactly happens okay. in nature right so if you, if you have a couple of species and they look morphologically very distinct right yeah uh, you you sequence a few mitochondrial genes and you see that there is very little genetic variation right so then you can kind of uh, you know you know that you know they they've not probably had the time to uh, uh, to to uh, uh, diversify genetically right uh, or they might actually represent the same population and they, this, this is probably just polymorphism in that species you know that the morphological variation that you see okay or maybe it is some complex which is still evolving in the process of everything is still evolving right uh, evolution yeah. is not static so everything is still evolving so yeah. at that point at which, at which point in uh, the time of divergence between these two lineages are you sampling at is the absolute uh, absolutely crucial thing here right yeah yeah uh, so chatanya basically with more uh, evidence of data we will we should come up to one concept of species right that two that two species are different from each other or same yeah so typically yes absolutely so you you would, you would need multiple lines of evidence and just genetic divergence itself is not enough uh, the way i see it and i think uh, my colleagues also agree with me on that uh, 
so, so yeah. if, if you if you if you discern there is genetic divergence between two groups or two populations and you also see let's say ecological uh, differences right let's say one mm -hmm. is a freshwater animal the other one is a arboreal animal now that is a clear that's a clear ecological distinction between these two lineages right yeah and if one is one is aquatic and the other one is arboreal uh, obviously there will be morphological differences also right yeah, so right. So yeah, so all these lines of evidence corroborate your hypothesis that, that these two lineages are distinct species, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. And, the more, and, and the more lines of evidence you have, the merrier, right? The less yeah. questions you get from reviewers and so on. Yeah, thank you. Cool. Okay, I'm moving on to the next slide. Okay, so when are species delimitation tools useful, right? So if you're talking about species delimitation tools that use that use molecular phylogenies okay so i hope you guys can see my uh, large black arrow here because i'm going to point a lot at this slide um, on the left you see uh, two very similar looking geckos hey, hey, uh, chaitanya can you use the pointer there's that pointer option no that might be better uh, uh, Praveen, that doesn't work on my laptop oh okay okay cool cool cool, cool. i mean uh, you are able to see my pointer right yeah yeah i can see it okay cool cool so okay, so on the left you have like two geckos that look very similar to each other, right? If you look, if if, if uh, this is a this is a genus of gecko called Dravido gecko, and uh, we worked on this group for about three years. But if you just show me these two geckos, photographs of these two geckos, I'll say I don't know what species they are because they look so distinct, right? However, these two geckos uh, belong to two completely different clades of of Dravido gecko, right? The one on the left is is a mid elevation clade. And the one on the right is a is, is a high elevation clade, right? And uh, <clears throat> so the point I'm getting at is, though they look so cryptic, they're genetically very divergent, right? On the right, you have two frogs that belong uh, to this group of bush, bush frogs called Rauchesters. Rauchesters are found very widely in the Western Ghats. So Dravidu gecko are also from the Western Ghats. Uh, so these two Rauchesters are both they are both sympatric species. Uh, they're found in the Nilgiris. Uh, you go to Uti, you'll see them very commonly. The one on the left, the one sitting on the leaf, is actually a ground dwelling Rauchestus. It's called Rauchestus spiniens. And the one on the right is a completely arboreal bush frog. It's, it's found on you know small bushes and sometimes on trees too. And it's called Rauchestus signatus. And it's got really trippy eyes. So these two uh, bush frogs are genetically very close to each other. If you look at this tree uh, in, the, in the bottom here, this is from uh, Vijay Kumar et al. 2014. If you look at this tree, you see that the Tinian clade and the Signatus clade are very, very close to each other. And there's very little genetic divergence between the two. But look at them morphologically, right? They're so distinct. You cannot mistake one for the other. So this is an example of, of a group that has a great deal of morphological variation, but very little genetic variation, right? And these two cases are in, in a sense and uh, antithetical to each other right so one you have this old lineage of geckos that that probably that, that actually diverged very early and but they have, they have, they've kind of reached a certain morphological stasis because they're niche conserved they, they occupy the same niche across their range no matter which species they are right this other group on the right has adapted brilliantly to to different niches in their habitat right for example, the, the, like, like we said, the Tinians is a ground dwelling frog and uh, Signatus is an arboreal frog. And this also represents a, a more recent uh, radiation of bush frogs, which means that they did not have a lot of time to establish the kind of genetic divergence that is required to tell them apart as distinct species. Right? Okay. So if you look at this graph at the, at the bottom left, <clears throat> Uh, the Dravido gecko, the geckos, uh, so this is a graph that basically has, uh, basically plots genetic divergence on the y-axis and morphological divergence on the x-axis, right? Very simple. So an animal like Dravido gecko would probably fall here in this circle. Look, look at where I'm pointing to. Because morphologically, they're very, very conserved, which means the morphological divergence is very little. But genetically, they're very distinct animals, right? And the Rauchesters or these bush frogs would probably fall in this circle over here, right? They're morphologically distinct animals, but genetically they're not very diverse, right? 
So species delimitation methods actually perform well along this axis, right? Where there is a lot of genetic divergence, no morphological divergence, or a lot of morphological divergence and very little genetic divergence, right? Species delimitation methods perform very well somewhere in between. Okay. Now, uh, I want you guys to tell me. So, what would you do if there, if you are working on a species group or, 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 or a group? that has very high morphological divergence and very high genetic divergence, right? You probably do not need species delimitation tools to tell those two species, tell species apart in that group, right? Because they are distinct morphologically and they are distinct genetically. There's, there's way too much divergence there in general, right? So you don't really need species delimitation tools or uh, SD tools over here. Similarly, what do you do with groups? Uh, let's say you're working on a group with very low genetic divergence and very low morphological divergence. What would you do here? Can someone tell me? Call it a species complex. Or call go and work with it. Sorry? Uh, call it a species complex. Or uh, that, will, that will be the species falling in the gray area. Leave them alone. Well, it could be species that are falling in the gray area. But, you know, the best thing to do in, 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 a, in a case where your group does not have too much morphological or genetic divergence is leave it the hell alone, right? Uh, you're not going to glean anything from, from that group, right? You just like treat it as one holistic group, right? Uh, so species delimitation tools, the point of the slide is that these tools work well along this axis where you have cryptic species or you have recent radiations and anywhere in between, right? So if your organisms fall in any of these uh, categories, then uh, absolutely use species delimitation tools. Okay. Uh, any other, any, any questions on the slide? Can I move on? So Chaitanya, I have a question about the rower castles frogs over there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you say when there's a lot of morphological divergence and like very less genetic divergence, don't you think genes are uh, genes are what is driving the morphological divergence? So why is there why is there no gene, genetic divergence? Well, we are not sequencing those genes, right? We are not sequencing those genes that are driving this uh, difference. No, but if we sequence those genes, we'll get totally different results. That's the reason we don't we don't we don't use uh, genes that are under positive selection, right? Okay, we use yeah, using a neutral one. Yes, we have to use uh, neutral markers uh, as, as much as we can and as far as we can. Because the moment you pick, uh, pick a gene that's under positive selection, it's not going to give you true evolutionary relationships, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, could be, it could be evolving very differently for different organisms. And it might, it might lead you to infer completely wrong relationships, right? Yeah, thanks. Okay, moving on. Uh, I have one question. I mean, when you spoke about the Stenians and uh, Signators thing, uh, and you said that they're genetically not much different, uh, what like what is not much difference according to you? And that depends upon the gene, I know, but still, what would you say? Because recently, uh, I think I read one paper on this uh, cricket frogs by KP Dinesh and colleagues and uh, they found like two different populations of cricket frogs one on the eastern guards and one on the western guards and there was like no intermediate populations uh, in between in the in the deccan plateau but these were like very like genetically not much divergent but they were morphologically super divergent and they also had geographic isolation so it's it's a little confusing though sometimes yeah so uh, when i say they're not very divergent from each other genetically if you take Rauch sisters as a, as a whole group, right, you have, you know, a certain range or, 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 a, or a certain range of divergence that you say, okay, this is interspecific divergence versus, you know, intraspecific divergence, which is a lot less, right? So when I say genetic divergence is a lot less between these two, uh, they're not, you know, uh, they don't conform to the kind of the, 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 the rest of the species in the group, you know, rest of the species pairs rather, right? Okay. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. 
So, for instance, let's say you you take uh, uh, kunurenses and charyas, right? They might, for example, have you know they, they might be five percent different from each other, right? But tinians and signators might just be two point two percent or two point three percent different. That's what I mean, right? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But if you look at groups like Dravidu Gecko on the on the same plane, they're they're some 18 percent different from each other, right? Uh, so you know, kind of tells you that they uh, they, they diversified very early in time. Right? But that is also the the gene of interest that you took might be like a faster evolving gene rather than the one that oh, is. Oh, you're talking about the genes with comparable uh, uh, yeah. you know, evolutionary rates, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We're not picking a nuclear and a mitochondrial gene. We have, let's say both mitochondrial genes, then that's the difference, right? Hmm. Also, okay. Chaitanya, why do you think that uh, there is such a fast evolution? Uh, I couldn't hear you properly. Sorry. Why do you think there was such a fast evolutionary uh, like rate of evolution in rabido geckos? The genetic divergence. Why is it so much? It's because they dive, they diverged from each other very early. So the diversification for Dravido gecko was very, very early in time, right? Ar around, the, I think the initial split was almost 40 million years ago, right? So they had a lot of time. And then and over time, there was a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, a lot of isolation because of uh, of changes in, 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 in paleoclimate, right? And because of that, they had the opportunity to kind of evolve independently as distinct lineages over a long period of time. So that's that's the reason. Whereas Rao Chesters are, are, are much more recent in the Indian Peninsula. Yeah. All right, thanks. Moving on in the interest of time. Okay, so let's look at, uh, I mean, we've been talking about all of this in the previous slide, but let's look at recent radiations versus reciprocal monophyly. So, uh, if you can assume that this phylogeny that we have, we have here is a species tree, okay. So when I say species tree, I mean that uh, this is these are the real relationships between these three organisms, uh, species A, B, and C. Let's assume God gave us this, uh, this this tree, and we have to take this tree at face value. So this whole tree here is 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 is, is a species tree that depicts the correct relationships between these three lineages A, B, and C. Right. And here, what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, infer the genealogy of a particular gene, right, with respect to the species tree that God has bestowed on us. Okay. So let's take take the next slide where it will become clearer. Okay. So here we have this uh, God-given species tree, and we have tried to uh, trace the genealogy of one gene uh, along the species tree, right? So if you notice, uh, this particular gene uh, has like various ancestral alleles, you know, right? So there is one light blue allele, there's one dark blue allele, and there is a green allele somewhere here in the ancestral population, right? Uh, so forget about uh, what else is shown in your, uh, uh, whatever else is shown in the slide, just focus on what I'm trying to say, right? And as you go forth in time, uh, these alleles kind, uh, these alleles kind of, uh, you know, uh, promulgate into each of these lineages randomly, right? As as we can see along uh, lineage leading to A, B, and C, right? Now, <clears throat> let's say I'm a field biologist and I'm working on this group uh, which comprises species A, B, and C, and I'm in the field and I sample these species at time t1, okay? And at time t1, you see that you know these these lineages have relatively recently diverged right they're not very old lineages they've, they've had uh, recent diversification events so if you sample over uh, sample over these populations uh, during time uh, t1 you'll see that species a provides you with a blue allele and two pink alleles and two green alleles right similarly species b gives you like three greens and one yellow allele and species c gives you purples, there's a deep purple and there's blue, right? Now, this is my sampling, right? And I have kind of sequenced all these alleles and I'm ready to build a phylogeny. Now, when I build a phylogeny using these alleles sampled at time T1, 
this is what my phylogeny is going to look like <clears throat> right if you notice the genealogy of this uh, uh, tree uh, of, of, of this gene you'll see that the two pink alleles in species a are immediately re related to each other by ancestry right so in the tree they will be depicted as immediate sisters similarly the two green alleles are immediately related by ancestry in the previous generation so those two are uh, uh, those two are related uh, uh, to each other. Uh, sorry, these two are related to each other, right? But the blue allele over here, uh, if you trace its genealogy genealogy back, it's 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 actually very distantly related to the other uh, alleles in the same lineage, right? And similarly with species B, right? You see that the yellow yellow allele is not really related uh, uh, immediately to the green ones and the same problem with species C. So if you build a phylogeny after uh, uh, sampling at time T1, you'll see that species A is paraphyletic with respect to species B. Species C is also paraphyletic with respect to species B and species B is polyphyletic, right? <clears throat> However, let's say we wait for a few more million years and sample the same lineages. I wouldn't call them the same organisms because they have evolved now the same lineages at time T2, right, and build a phylogeny, you will notice that now species, the alleles from species A and uh, uh, alleles from species B and C are reciprocally monophyletic and this whole group is reciprocally monophyletic with species A, right. Whereas at time T1, you didn't even get the right topology, right. Here in time T1, you kind of see that uh, A and B are more closely related to each other as opposed to C, right? So the point I'm trying to make here is that at time T1, the alleles that we are sampling are not really sorted, okay? Mean, which means that these lineages have not had enough time in isolation for these alleles to be sorted on their own, right? And But whereas at time T2, these alleles have spent enough time in isolation and therefore they give you the true relationships between species A, B and C. So this tree over here built at time two uh, reflects exactly the species tree that we have, that, that God has given us, right? So the problem happens when you're actually seek, uh, when you're actually doing, uh, uh, when you're doing the sampling over here at, at, at time T1 is when you will get such warped phylogenies and this is because the lineages here are not sorted yet. And this is, a, this is the phenomenon that Praveen was explaining yesterday called incomplete lineage sorting, right? Now this slide is a little important and it is the basis for, on, on which we're gonna present the next slides. So if you don't understand the slide, just stop and ask me. Um, so just like, uh, I mean, uh, at any given point of time, right? Let's say time Tn, there could be two distinct species, right? one which exhibits incomplete lineage sorting and one that exhibits complete lineage sorting right at the same time because they, they because these two species could have diverged at completely different times right one species had enough uh, as in one group had enough time for the lineages to sort and the other one uh, is a more recent uh, diver diversification event so you know the, the the lineages are not completely sorted so you could have two species groups at the same time one with incomplete lineage sorting and one with completely sorted lineages, right? So this is one of the problems that we have and this is one of the problems that species trees try to uh, try to mitigate, right? Uh, is the slide clear before I move on? So, uh, this recent radiation, uh, the the chart which we have below so what if we get such kind of phylogeny what how do we deal with that what do we call them so this is where your whole gene tree species tree discordance comes into play right so one of the things that you should remember is uh, the one of the uh, major factors for incomplete lineage sorting is ancestral polymorphism or ancestral allelic polymorphism right so here, if you notice the ancestral population here, uh, as my cursor, yeah, the ancestral population here has at least four alleles. Okay. Now there could be a different gene that you're sampling, which probably had only, you know, uh, one allele or two alleles in the ancestral population. And 
to, and such genes are more likely to uh, uh, resolve themselves faster, right? Uh, or, or sort themselves faster in independent lineages. So therefore, when you build gene trees of uh, uh, gene uh, gene trees using genes that have uh, very differing evolutionary histories in terms of ancestral allelic polymorphism and different rates of evolution, you get disparate topologies in different gene trees. And when you see disparate topologies, you kind of can uh, hypothesize that there is incomplete lineage sorting going on, and I need to have a consensus species tree built to discern the correct phylogenies, right? So that is the problem. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So if you're, if you're only looking at a single. Okay. So if you're only looking at a single gene tree, you cannot uh, you cannot discern incomplete lineage sorting. You'll just take this phylogeny at face value. But when you when you look at multiple gene trees for the same set of organisms and there is discordance, then you can kind of hypothesize that it might be incomplete lineage sorting or sometimes it could be hybridization as well. And there are ways to tell the two apart uh, and so on, right? Okay, so the point of the slide is that cryptic older radiations might be reciprocally monophyletic like Trabido gecko, okay? But at, at the molecular level, but they might be polyphyletic in their morphology, which means two completely different Dravido gecko species could look the same but they might be uh, genetically uh, very distinct, right? And similarly, recent rapid radiations uh, might have distinct morphologies because they have adapted to different niches and so on, but yet there could be incomplete lineage sorting in their genes. Okay, so that's the whole point of this slide. <clears throat> okay, moving on. <clears throat> okay, the key idea. So how do species delimitation tools work right what is the key idea and what what is the what is the underlying funda so all the species delimitation tools assume that to, there are two distinct evolutionary processes going on right one is called the interspecific birth death diversification and the other is called intraspecific coalescence okay now if you look at any phylogeny like the phylogeny on your right you see that there are various internal nodes in the phylogeny, right? And each internal node represents a point where there is a phylogenetic split, correct? Now, does this phylogenetic split or diversification event represent a speciation event? Now, that is the million dollar question with all species delimitation tools, right? So, as you can see, closer to the leaf nodes also, there are a lot of... Uh, Internal, there are a lot of internal nodes, right? There are phylogenetic splits happening here also. So, how do you quantify these phylogenetic splits in a phylogeny? So, basically, what these species delimitation tools do is that they they are, they they run the phylogeny through the birth death model, okay, and they calculate probabilities as given by the birth death model. Similarly, they run the same phylogeny through the coalescent model and calculate the probabilities for each node or each phylogenetic split in the tree. Okay. And then if a certain node has a higher probability uh, or is explained better using the birth death model, right, it is considered a speciation event. Whereas if a certain if certain other nodes are better explained by coalescence. Or the coalescent theory, which means that those nodes have a much higher probability in the coalescent model, then such nodes are not considered speciation events, right? Such nodes are considered uh, considered you know intraspecific divergence, right? So each phylogeny is subjected to both these models. We'll be looking at how these two models work, but this is the basic idea, right? So based on running a phylogeny through these two models all these tools come up with a cutoff right or an inflection point saying that okay beyond this cutoff every node explains intraspecific divergence and like before this cutoff every node explains interspecific diversification right so if you look at the, uh, the phylogeny on the right you see this red line right this red line is a hypothetical cutoff or the inflection point which says that all nodes occurring after the red line basically represent intraspecific uh, 
uh, you know, intraspecific divergence, whereas all the nodes before the red line in the phylogeny are basically uh, interspecific, uh, uh, or or these are these basically represent species uh, uh, speciation events, right? So you can also use what's called a lineage to through time plot, and some of these tools do that. We'll show you in the practicals uh, to actually come up with an inflection point, right? Saying that you know all the lineages that have emerged after the red line represent intraspecific divergence and the lineages before the red line actually represent distinct species right is this clear because this is going to be the point of the next five or six slides yeah clear okay great so let's look at let's go into some details into you know birth death and intraspecific uh, it can get a little uh, hairy but uh, yeah, I'll try to do my best. I've not presented these charts ever, and even my colleagues have not seen them. So it's going to be what it's going to be. Okay, here we go. So the birth death model uh, is is basically like yesterday. If you remember when we were doing uh, star beast analysis, uh, we gave uh, 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 we had to choose between various species priors, right? We chose there was a Yule model, there was a birth death model, and there was some. Bayesian skyline model and so on and so forth. So birth death model is basically a species, uh, speciation model or species tree model, right? So the whole point of the birth death model is to determine the rate of speciation in a phylogeny, okay? And therefore, the number of species that exist in a phylogeny that is presented to it, okay? So birth is nothing but a speciation event and death is nothing but an extinction event. These guys could have well called this the speciation extinction model, but just to make our lives a little harder, they called it birth death model, just to sound cool, maybe, right? And the birth, the, the speciation rates are represented by, uh, or the birth rate is represented by lambda, and the death rate is represented by mu. So it is obvious that, you know, this assumes that your phylogeny includes extinct animals as well, right? There is a representation for extinct animals as distinct lineages in your phylogeny, because it, it then allows the model to calculate birth rate and death rate, which is basically extinction rate. Right? <clears throat> Here, the number of species at time t is a function of waiting time between speciation events, the birth rate, the death rate, and the number of lineages at time t. Right. So if you look at this phylogeny on the right, you see that there is a waiting time between speciation. The first speciation event happens here, the second one happens here, third one over here, fourth one over here, and so on and so forth. Right. So the number of species at any given point of time t is a function of, according to the birth rate model, is a function of the waiting time between speciation events, birth rate, death rate, and the number of lineages present uh, at the time t. Right. And then there is this rudimentary, uh, you know, uh, state diagram which kind of uh, shows you how the birth death model might work. So you start with zero, and then there is a certain speciation rate, and then you go to one species. And then the speciation rate changes because the number of lineages have changed. Then there are two species and so on and so forth till you get to n species. Remember that every intermediary uh, region, the speciation rate changes because it is dependent on the number of lineages that are present at that time, right? And the same thing holds good for the extinction rate, which is represented by mu over here. Uh, Chaitanya? Yeah. May I ask a question here? Uh, sure. Uh, Maybe I am not understanding it properly, but sure. uh, the event of speciation, you will have species increasing by two, right? So you scale it down to one or what? No. So if you look at uh, this lineage, for example, right? Mm -hmm. So at this point, there is one lineage, right? Right. When there is a phylogenetic split. This one lineage becomes two lineage. So there is an increase of one. Okay. Right? Okay. Yeah, it, increase, it increases by one. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So moving on. Yesterday we chose the the Yule model uh, for for speciation, right? In in our star beast analysis, we picked the Yule model. The Yule model is really a simplification of the birth death model, and the Yule model basically does not assume that any extinction is going on in your group, right? Uh, give me a second. Yeah. So if you typically have phylogenies that don't have extinct animals represented, it's best to use the Yule model. So the Yule model only has lambda, which is speciation rate, and it does it assumes that mu is zero, which is the extinction rate. 
So the important, most important aspect of the Yule model is that uh, it, it, it kind of infers that the waiting time between birth events or phylogenetic splits is exponential, right? For instance, if I go back to the previous slide, if you look at this phylogeny here, you see that the waiting time as we go uh, along time, uh, along like let's say uh, geological time, we see that the waiting time between speciation events keeps decreasing, right? So the Yule model assumes that birth events or phylogenetic splits, uh, the waiting time between splits in, uh, actually reduces exponentially, right? Not increases, it reduces exponentially. So this should actually be waiting time between birth events is negative exp exponential and not exponential. And similarly, so is the probability of speciation events with respect to time given a time tree, right? So what they're trying to say is basically that if you have a phylogenetic split somewhere here in your tree at, at, at the older nodes, it has a much better probability of representing a speciation event, right? But as you go younger in your phylogeny, in your time tree, right? The splits have a lesser probability of representing speciation events, right? So that is what uh, the the Yule model basically uh, that's that's basically the you know, funda that the Yule model functions on. And if you look at this graph over here, uh, on the y-axis you have the probability of a node or a phylogenetic split representing a speciation event, and on the on the y-axis, uh, sorry, on the x-axis you have time. So you see how the how the probability kind of decreases uh, exponentially over time, right? For, for nodes to actually represent speciation events. So the younger the younger the phylogenetic split, the less likely or the less probable that it represents a speciation event. That's the premise that the that any birth death model uses and works on, right? <clears throat> okay. It, the model also uses a parameter called P, which is the probability of sampling a species at present time. Now this is a pretty cool parameter because most of us, when we go sample, the sampling is random, right? We in all likelihood will not have all the extant lineages in our phylogeny, right? So this, this uh, parameter P actually accounts for not sampling certain lineages, right? Here in this phylogeny on the left, if you see, let's say we have sampled these three lineages and, but uh, this lineage we've not sampled the, the you know, the, the subpopulation or the, the, the sub lineages in here, if that's even a word. And we just have the single branch coming up in our phylogeny, right? As opposed to three uh, clades over here. Now, this model, uh, the so the Yule model will actually use a pa probability parameter called P to kind of correct for this random sampling. Okay, so that's what that P means. <clears throat> and the rate of speciation and therefore number of species also depends on the start of the process or the age of the root of your of your ultrametric tree. So these are some of the parameters. Th these are the parameters that the pure birth model uses in order to come up with speciation rates and therefore the number of species that are present in your phylogeny. Right. Hey, so, uh, Chaitanya, can I just uh, uh, just ask a question because I, I'm confused about one thing. Yeah. So you for Yule model, you still have to have a speciation rate to start with, <clears throat> right? Well, so uh, you won't you won't have a speciation rate to start with. But you will kind of uh, give a, a broad prior for speciation rate, right? So that is how that works. You generally don't have to have a speciation rate. So what what does use model say about like the the size of the ancestral population? Oh, we'll get there. We'll get there. So the uh, use model does not actually depend on the size of the ancestral population. None of the okay. birth death models do. Right? Okay. okay. Okay, so ancestral population or effective ancestral population sizes are more a parameter for the, for the coalescent rather than the birth rate model. Okay, okay. Right. Okay, so if I have to kind of graphically represent the Yule model, it's very simple. It looks like this. So you give the model an ultrametric time calibrated tree and it discerns the root age, it discerns the sampling probability, which is basically the probability that you have not sampled certain lineages and so on and accounts for that and corrects for that. And it also comes up with a speciation rate. And once it comes up with a speciation rate, it's fairly straightforward to come up with the number of species that you have in your phylogeny, right? And 
in order to account for the fact that uh, the speciation rate is uh, uncertain and not give speciation rate an absolute value, uh, we do what everybody else does. We give the speciation rate a hyperprior, which means we give it a mean and a standard deviation. So uh, the speciation rate is across a range and not an absolute value. Right. So this is basically a graphical represent, a simple graphical representation of uh, how the Yule model works. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> the next slide. Uh, so okay. So basically, the the pure birth of the Yule model uh, runs on a Bayesian framework, which means it tries to calculate the posterior probability of the speciation rate given mu. Mu, as you see here, is the time tree. Right. This is basically mu. So what is the posterior probability or like uh, a, a more intelligent probability of speciation rate given the uh, time tree mu and that's explained by this Bayesian formula. I'm not really going to go into it. One represents the, but one represents the prior probability of, of, uh, of lambda given an exponential distribution multiplied by the likelihood of lambda given the time tree divided by the probability of the time tree. Okay. So this is a typical, this is the typical Bayesian formula. If you guys have uh, done some level of Bayesian statistics, you'll, you'll, you'll recognize this formula instantly. Right? Okay. And the number of species at time t is a function of waiting time between speciation events, the speciation rate and the number of lineages at time t. Right? So that's how the uh, birth model works. Um, <clears throat> okay. And now we have the constant rate birth death process, which is the birth death model as we, uh, uh, you know, we saw one of those options in Starbeast yesterday. So it basically does the same thing that the Yule model does, except it accounts for extinction rates as well, right? It, ba it basically accounts for uh, the mu parameter. Uh, so this is under the assumption again that you have extinct organisms in your phylogeny and the program can actually infer extinction rates, right? And so this, graphical uh, representation of the uh, birth death model. So instead of applying priors on the absolute speciation and extinction rates, they apply priors on a modification of the speciation rate called the diversification rate and another uh, parameter called turnover, which depends on both speciation and extinction rate. Right? So they apply uh, hyper priors on these two parameters and they come up with uh, the number of species. So this is the you know birth death process versus the Yule process, which is pure birth. Right. Uh, yeah. Any questions so far? Okay. There's stoic silence. So I'm assuming there are no questions. No. Uh, Prashant has a question. Uh, Prashant, you want to go ahead? Or uh, so? Oh, okay. Microphone is not working. So Prashant uh, asks a question. Could you explain why the recently diverged lineages are not considered in the model? Recently diverged lineages are not considered in the model. Yeah, I think he's talking about the previous slide. This one. Uh, no, the the Yule, the previous one, the phylogeny where you show, show the speciation rates. Yeah. I'm not sure I understand the question. So basically, I think what his question is, why are more recent uh, uh, phylogenetic splits or diversification events not not considered as as species uh, uh, you know as, as sorry are not considered speciation events right so that's that's the premise on which the Yule model and the birth rate model work that the older your split the the more the chance that there is a speciation event that has occurred the younger your split right it probably represents just phylogenetic uh, or sorry genetic di divergence between populations right so the probability of this node for example being a speciation event will be much much less than the probability of this node being a speciation event right so that's the premise in which this model works so chetna yeah um, it means like more recent the i mean the split it means kind of intraspecific coalescence or something like that We'll get to coalescence. Just uh, focus on the focus on this, okay. uh, okay. this divergent okay. model. Yeah. We'll get to coalescence when we get there. We're going to get there in a minute. Right? Okay. 
Okay, so the bottom line here to remember is all species delimitation tools use the birth death model uh, or the Yule model to identify uh, inter interspecific divergence or phylogenetic splits that represent speciation events, right? And all these species delimitation tools use the coalescent model to infer within population divergence, right? Which means those divergences or phylogenetic splits are not really speciation events, right? So it uses the coalescent to decipher intraspecific and uses birth death to decipher interspecific. The reason I'm reiterating this so many times is because this is the basis of the whole presentation that I'm doing. And this is this should be really your take home message, right? Okay, so now let's look at the coalescent approach. Now, this is a chart that basically <clears throat> shows coalescence in a very simple uh, uh, way. So the coalescent thinking thinking views populations backwards in time, as opposed to the you know uh, the birth death model, which looks at it forwards, which looks at it from the oldest node to the you know most recent uh, leaf nodes, right? So the coalescent approach is about viewing populations backwards, and I, uh, 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 you know, I urge you guys to spend, you know, be a little attentive because the coalescent is what most phylogenetic, uh, you know, methods are about these days, and everybody is using this to do various things. So it's important that you kind of grasp this concept, and I'm just going to use this opportunity to show you how the coalescent works, also, right? So <clears throat> if you look at these charts on the top right. Uh, divergence is when you when you view the tree from old the oldest to the newest nodes, whereas coalescence is when you view it backwards. Right? When you when you look at the tip nodes and you build a story, the story backwards, right up to you know the oldest uh, root, right? So it's it's a it's a it's a major paradigm shift uh, in terms of tree building uh, as we know it. Right? So the coalescent theory estimates the probability of two alleles in a population to coalesce back in time, <clears throat> right? So evidently, if the two alleles are related to each other very closely, let's say they are from the same population, they will, they will coalesce very immediately back in time, right? But let's say these two alleles are from two very distinct species, right? They will take a much longer time to coalesce, okay? So the coalescent theory works on the principle that if two alleles coalesce, very early in time, maybe in the next generation, next the the immediately previous generation, the probability of them coalescing is much higher. Okay, so it gives it gives it a high probability value. Whereas if two alleles are very distinct and they, they take a longer time to coalesce, that probability the probability of coalescence goes down for those two alleles. Right? It reduces significantly. But in the end, we all know that all alleles have to coalesce at some point in time, no matter what organisms you are. You know, even if you have a complete diversity of organisms that you are you are trying to build a phylogeny of, they'll all coalesce at some point in time because life on Earth itself is monophyletic, so there's no escaping coalescence, right? The probability that the coalescent, the sorry, the coalescent probability is basically a function of divergence time, which is basically the time taken for divergence to occur between these two alleles and the effective population sizes that led to these two uh, alleles during modern times right for example let's say a1 a2 and a3 are the three alleles that we have for species a right the effective population size is represented here by theta a right and similarly for b1 and b2 the effective population size for these two alleles is represented by theta b right similarly the divergence time uh, chaitanya chaitanya might want to tell the people what effective population size is yes yes i'm getting that i'm getting that Okay, okay, right? okay. Yeah. So similarly, divergence time is is the time taken for these two alleles to coalesce, right? And if you look at it from uh, the forward direction, how long have they taken to diverge, right? So in a in a typical species tree or in an ideal species tree, the length of the branches represent divergence time, and the width of the branches, right? They ref represent effective population sizes, right? Typically, in other phylogenies where you know we, you know, which we build, we don't really care for branch width, right? But in species trees, you do care for branch width because the branch width represents effective population sizes. Though most species tree building algorithms don't really give you uh, effective population sizes in terms of branch width, 
they just throw out effective population sizes as different parameters in your output file right but this is how like a model species tree is shown now coming back to what praveen uh, was saying what do you mean by effective population size right <clears throat> so if you're sequencing a mitochondria if you're sequencing a nuclear gene right uh, and you know that the nuclear uh, any nuclear gene that you uh, sequence is, uh, is 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 diploid right which means it has uh, uh, two alleles and it also comes from both parents it's it's inherited from both parents so compare that with sequencing a mitochondrial gene which is haploid which means there's only one allele and it comes from only one parent which is the mother right or compare it with a Y chromosome, a gene from the Y chromosome, which is only paternally inherited. Okay. So the effective population size is a function of the evolutionary history of the gene we are talking about. So, so if you talk about a nuclear gene and uh, you, you say that the effective population size, for example, of, of a nuclear gene is one, for the same organisms, you'd say the effective population size of the corresponding mitochondrial gene is 0.25, right? Because it is haploid versus diploid, so you divide it by two, and then it comes from it's it's inherited from a single parent versus two parents. So you, you divide that by two again, so that's by four. That's point two five, right? Uh, did you guys understand the concept? Yeah, Chaitanya, I would just like to add. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So your explanation was was fine, um, uh, but uh, I just wanted to add that. Uh, uh, when we talk about effective population size, it is smaller than the actual population size of a species. Yep. Uh, the effective population size is the the number of reproducing individuals in a species, because those are the ones that pass on the genes to the next generation, right? Uh, and however, the effective population size of uh, allele uh, changes depending on the kind of marker that you're using and that's what chaitanya explained you know whether it is uh, mitochondrial y chromosomal or uh, or uh, um, nuclear. Uh, nuclear right or so uh, let's let's say that you know in a you know there's a population of say 10 individuals uh, the effective population size would be you know the number of reproducing individuals and maybe only five of them are reproducing so then the effective population size would be five uh, and then the effective population size for a nuclear uh, uh, loci would be two times five because you know these individuals are deployed, right? So there are two copies of the gene in the population. So the effective population size for that particular nuclear gene would then be ten, whereas the effective population size for uh, uh, mitochondrial would be one fourth of that, uh, and so forth. And uh, and for Y chromosome also the same thing. Uh, okay, uh, Chetanya, carry on. Yeah, so like Praveen said, it is absolutely essential for the coalescent model to determine effective population sizes, right? The probability of two alleles coalescing is completely dependent on the effective ancestral population size. And that is that is the reason why the coalescent model determines effective population size as it goes. So if you notice in this tree over here, uh, the effective population size for species A, B and C is represented by this, the width of this uh, branch, which is the ancestral lineage of A, B, and C. So that is how the coalescent actually builds back in time to determine, you know, uh, when alleles coalesced. Okay. So if you guys have any questions on the slide, because the slide is absolutely important, can you please uh, shoot? I'm going to take a 30 second uh, loo break, and you can probably ask Praveen Roy and Janvi uh, these questions. Back in about 30 seconds. <laughs> Yeah, so I also wanted to add that, um, did I unmute myself? Yes, I did. Uh, that, uh, you know, if the effective population size is large, then the alleles in that particular species will uh, would have taken longer to coalesce uh, because there are, there are more number of alleles that have to coalesce back in time. Uh, Whereas if the effective population size is smaller, then you know usually the coalescent time is much shorter. That, that is not always the case, but yeah, that is usually what happens. Um, okay, if you, if you guys have any questions, let us know.
Hello, I had one actually. Uh, the math which Chaitanya uh, showed about uh, the problem, the probability being ten and uh, two point five, uh, I understood that uh, it it may get half because of the haploid condition. But uh, in totality, I couldn't uh, understand. Could you please uh, uh, elaborate it a bit? Uh, this was between nuclear and mitochondrial. Yeah. 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 Okay. So you know, uh, basically, mitochondrial. If you take any population uh, where you have, say, the gender ratio is one is to one, uh, where there are equal numbers of males and females, uh, and if you look at a nuclear marker, right, it is passed on by both males and females to the next generation, uh, whereas the mitochondrial marker is passed on only by the female to the next generation. Uh, it lands up in the uh, in the male offspring also, but in the male offspring, it's an evolutionary dead end, right? So automatically, the effective population size of mitochondrial DNA now is half of uh, nuclear uh, marker. Secondly, mitochondrial markers are haploid, so you have to take that into consideration. So that's how it becomes one fourth of nuclear uh, DNA. Does that make sense? Yes, totally does. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. That's why because most uh, most of these tools that use the coalescent, right? We have to uh, we have to explicitly mention the ploidy of the markers that we're using. For even in Star Beast, if you notice, we, have, we there was a there was a little uh, uh, option there called ploidy, which lets you uh, specify if your marker is mitochondrial, y chromosomal, or uh, autosomal. Right, and because for these these tools, these effective population sizes are absolutely critical. Yeah. Hello, Chaitanya. I have one question. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I am just wondering that what will be the effective population size for any X chromosomal marker compared to nuclear marker? Because for yeah. male offspring, it is uniparental, and for uh, female offspring, it is biparental. Aritra, good question. Do the math. We have already told you uh, how to calculate for Y and uh, uh, mitochondrial. So do the math. Uh, you, you, you'll, you'll figure it out. Yeah, I, I'm just thinking that for for female for female offspring it is biparental, but for male offspring it is uniparental. So yeah, so that, that okay, just okay, do okay. the math. We can get yeah, back yeah, to that. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. So should that be three four? It should be one by eight, I think. One eight. No, no. Just give it some thought. Do the math, and yeah, we, yeah, we can yeah. get back to it later. Okay, 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 okay. Prashant has a question. So he asks, uh, does the coalesce depend upon the size of the genome or number of genes the organism has? The probability of coalescing depends on how close the two alleles are related. If the two alleles are more closely related, they have a much higher probability of coalescing, right? Yeah, I just wanted to add that it has got nothing to do with size of the genome or the yeah. number of genes. We are just looking at a gene, right? And what's happening uh, to alleles at that particular locus in the population. So it does not matter how large the genome of the organism is and how many genes it has. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to know that uh, which approach is more uh, recommended or uh, you know sort of uh, gives us better uh, understanding the diverge one or the coalescent approach. So for species delimitation, like I said, we are using both models to decipher how many species there are in a phylogeny, right? Sorry, I didn't get you. Could you repeat? All all the species delimitation tools uh -huh. use both models. Uh, simultaneously, right? They are yeah. complementing models. They're not. They're not competing models. Okay. Okay. Fine. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So I think uh, we are getting out of time, and it's it's time to gallop. Okay. So let's look at the coalescent in a very simple uh, uh, way, right? Let's assume that we have a, a right fisher population. Right. So, what does the right fisher population mean? It's it's probably the simplest uh, population model in population genetics. So, it assumes that the population size is finite, 
excuse me, <clears throat> and it assumes that generations don't overlap, which means at a given time unit t, there is only one generation of that organism. And given time t plus one, that old generation is gone and there is a completely new generation, which means there is a 100% turnover in population, right, as uh, along with generations. And then it assumes that there is random mating, which means uh, pairs are selected uh, uh, randomly. Uh, and there is no selection happening, there is no population structure, and there is no mutation. <clears throat> okay, so this is like a this is like a very simplistic uh, population model. And let's look at this chart here. Let's assume at at time t zero, we have uh, the, a set of these these individuals that are represented by blue alleles. Okay, uh, at 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 the beginning, right? And as we go on, <clears throat> uh, you know, there is a new allele that drops up because of you know uh, random uh, reproduction and as we go further you see that you know the, the the dynamics of the population changes there are you know many more alleles that are propping up in the population so the right fisher model i uh, forgot to mention the only evolutionary process that is acting on the right fisher model is genetic drift right there is no other uh, pressure on, on on this population that's the assumption at least right so as we go and we reach present time this is what the modern or the present day population of these organisms look like. This is basically the, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, the, these are the different alleles in today's population, right? Now, if, if we have to do like the traditional way of tree building, we would kind of decipher <clears throat> how the modern alleles have come and we'll, we'll kind of, you know, get, uh, get a genealogy of these alleles, right? We go from oldest to the newest, uh, you're looking at divergence, right? But the coalescence actually explains, uh, gives us a better platform to explain this, uh, the relationship be relationship between all these different alleles in today's population, right? So the way the coalescent works is, let's say you have sampled these two green alleles, <clears throat> a blue allele, these pink alleles and, and a yellow allele or an orange allele. And so, when you use the coalescent, it is going to look at these alleles and see when they coalesced back in time, right? So what it is here telling you that the two pink alleles immediately coalesced in the previous generation, right? The two green alleles took a little longer to coalesce and the orange ones took a little longer to coalesce. And so the fundamentally the, the relationship between the green and the blue allele goes really back in time because they coalesce uh, like, uh, you know, uh, very early. Right. So this is like just a graphical representation of, of how coalescence works and how you can, you know, decipher relationships between alleles based on uh, based on modern day populations. Right. So <clears throat> now let's quickly look at uh, some uh, <clears throat> coalescent probabilities. Right. This is where it gets interesting. And I want you guys to uh, unmute and answer when I ask you questions. Right. So let's assume a Fisher Wright population, okay, which has n individuals in every generation, okay, and even the most the the most recent generation, which is today, has n individuals, right? Now, what is the probability that two individuals coalesce and find the same ancestor in the previous generation? Can someone tell me? So the probability of two individuals from a lineage or population coalescing is the probability of them choosing the same ancestor. So in this particular case, what is that probability? It's very simple. One. Of both coalescing is one. Ten by one. Sorry? Ten by, ten by one should be for the one, uh, for the first one. Only one allele coming to uh, that one. 10 by 1. 1 by 10. Yeah, 1 by 10. 1 by 10. 1 by 10 should be for the only uh, for one allele to come uh, to that one. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, uh, we'll have to add two prob probabilities. Now, what is the yeah. power to both, both choose the same ancestor from the previous generation? Someone is it how? Okay, so because we are assuming right Fisher pop, right Fisher population model here, this particular individual 
should have definitely come from some organism from the previous generation, right? So the probability that this had an ancestor in the previous generation is in fact one, not one by n, right? Similarly, the probability that another or, or, or the second individual chooses the same ancestor as the first one is basically one by n, right? One into one by n. You guys got it? Yeah. So just multiply the two probabilities. One multiplied by one by n, the probability that two organisms will coalesce at a single common ancestor is one by n, right? It's a simple math. Uh, uh, Chaitanya, can I just uh, 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 maybe explain this in a slightly simpler manner? Sure. Uh, so let's say you have a basket with, uh, uh, let's say you have a basket with, uh, you know, uh, ten marbles, and you have uh, uh, you have uh, numbered them one to ten, right? Uh, so the first thing is, uh, you know, you're you're bl blindfolded and you just uh, randomly pick some marble uh, so what is the probability that you will pick any marble not a not a particular number the probability of picking any marble is one yeah. right now you look at that marble and you realize it is marble number three okay now you put it back now you put your hand back into the uh, basket and what is the probability that you will pick marble number three which is one by ten yeah. So the probability of picking the same marble is 1 into 1 by n, or 1 by 10 in this case, which is basically 1 by n. That's what uh, Chaitanya is showing. Uh, I hope that's clear. It's simple, right? Simple enough? Yes. OK, so if this is the probability of choosing the same ancestor, what is the probability of not choosing the same ancestor? Come on, guys. 1 minus 1 by n. Exactly. So the probability of coalescing is 1 by n, right? So the probability of not coalescing is 1 minus 1 by n, right? As simple as that, right? Now, let's, let's just improve slightly on this, right? Now, what is the probability that two individuals will coalesce at generation g plus 1? OK, let's say that generation is somewhere here, OK? What is the probability that these two individuals will coalesce at generation g plus 1? So basically the probability of that happening is first the probability that they don't coalesce up to, n gen up to g generations, correct? So they shouldn't coalesce to g generations and they should coalesce at g plus 1, right? So what is the probability that they don't coalesce to g generations? It's just this, 1 minus 1 by n, which is the probability of not coalescing. To, uh, to the power of G because up to G generations, they cannot coalesce, right? Multiplied by the probability of coalescing at G plus one. And what is the probability of coalescing? It is one by N, right? So the probability of two individuals coalescing at generation G plus one is one by N multiplied by one minus one by N to the power G. Straightforward? Yes. Any questions? Okay, everyone is very good at probability theory, I'm thinking. So yeah, so so this is very simple arithmetic, right? Very simple, but very elegant. Now, here what we've done is we have assumed that there are two individuals. And these two individuals have a probability of coalescing or not coalescing and which generation and so on. Now, if you just extrapolate this idea to, let's say, M individuals, you have M samples from the current set. So what is the probability that two individuals from M will coalesce? Right, so it is it is basically m choose two or m c two. Right, you randomly pick two individuals from a population of m, and what is the probability that they they'll coalesce in g plus one generations? So you just modify the simple formula like this. Right, it's 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 uh, actually fairly straightforward. <clears throat> so do you guys understood? Uh, did, did you guys understand how m choose two came into picture? No, Ted, can you explain this once more? So up until here, we were assuming there are just two individuals, right? And we were figuring out uh, the probability of them coalescing. 
But in reality, we have M, we have sampled M individuals. So therefore, we have M alleles with us, right? So what is the probability that two out of these M every time you, you randomly pick two alleles, what is the probability that they will coalesce? And so, and what is basically the formula for randomly picking two from a, a set of M? So that is MC2, right? M choose two. Yeah. Right. So you replace one by M choose two because we are we are picking allelic pairs randomly and figuring out where they will coalesce, right? So this this formula basically changes to this. It's just as simple as that, right? Yeah. So uh, this thing basically represents M choose two. It's the American way of representing it. Indians would probably write M C two, right? <clears throat> okay. Moving on. Now what we've done is so far we have assumed that the populations have constant sizes across generations that these populations have constant size of n because we are assuming right fisher right however we know that uh, and also we were assuming that time is geometric because if you look at this equation for all practical purposes this is a geometric equation it's not an exponential equation right so we are assuming that time is uh, is, is discrete or geometric and all these generations that we are talking about neatly fit into time units right but in reality it's not like that generations overlap and time by no means is geometric right time is continuous <clears throat> and we've also assumed that only one coalescent event occurring at time t if you look at this uh, this formula right it's just one coalescent event now we just basically forget about all the, forget about what's there in the rest of the slides we are just now assuming that population sizes change over time which means that the population size is a function of time, right? So that basically represents this n t here, where you're basically saying that, you know, instead of n, absolute n, you're assuming that n is a function of time. And time is in fact continuous and should be represented by uh, an exponential distribution. And the standard exponential probability density function is, you know, you all might have seen this, uh, lambda multiplied by e power minus lambda t, where t is time. And we have to calculate the probability of all coalescent events <clears throat> in the population, right? So when you correct for all these things, when you especially when you con uh, when you correct for the fact that time is continuous and not discrete, you get this hideous looking equation over here. Okay. So basically, what I've done is I've saved you the horror of uh, uh, kind of uh, getting to this uh, or, or or deriving this uh, equation, but basically this equation gives you the, uh, the the probability of all coalescent events in one population or one lineage right this is the this is the formula and this formula is basically what people call the coalescent so when somebody says the coalescent they basically mean this formula right and this is in most models used in software this probability completely depends on population sizes and divergence times or the, or the times to coalesce and the main thing we should remember here is that whatever we have done so far is basically the probability of coalescence for one lineage, right? However, in a species tree, we in a species tree like this, we have more than one lineage. We have A, B, and C, and then there are ancestral lineages too, right? So the idea is to apply this coalescent or this formula to each branch in the phylogeny, right? and the ancestral branches too, in order to get the coalescent probability of this entire gene for this particular species tree. Is that clear? Yep. Yeah. So, so you, you apply the coalescent on every branch of your phylogeny. Your phylogeny here is a species tree. And you calculate the probability of coalescence for your entire gene tree, right? So this basically is nothing but the probability of your gene tree given a species tree, right? So this is what you're calculating whenever uh, you're, you're, you're running the multi-species coalescent using star beast or BBP or whatever you do, right? Okay, now here's the next level of complexity. This is only for one gene, gene GI, right? In our data set, we could have multiple genes, right? We could have four, like, like four genes or even 10 genes and so on. So the final probability of a species tree 
is given by this Bayesian formula, right? Which is basically the posterior probability of the species tree given your complete data set is explained by this, this, this Bayesian formula, where <clears throat> this uh, factor is basically standard likelihood for a gene tree given the sequence alignment for that gene. Okay. And this factor is basically the coalescent likelihood for gene tree given the species tree, which is basically what this one. This is what we just calculated, right? Multiplied by the prior the prior for the species tree. And this prior could be uniform prior, birth, death, or yule. Okay. And the denominator is basically the marginal likelihood of the data, which in the Bayesian theorem always tends to one, but is never one. Okay. So it's somewhere around 0 0.98 or 0 0.99. So this formula basically allows you to sample probability space for various species trees and get posterior probabilities for each species, uh, sorry, each species tree given that the, given the gene trees that we have. So is that clear or is it just too confusing? Yeah, actually, it would be great if you uh, go through it uh, once more in a different manner or maybe uh, okay. whatever. To give you an example with this species tree itself, here you have a species tree, right? On your left, here you're saying that B and C are sisters and A is sister to B plus C, correct? According to this species tree. So this is one species tree hypothesis that we test using all the genes that we have, that we've sequenced, right? And we get the posterior probability for this species tree. Next, what we do is we build another species tree, for example, and say that in that species tree, A and B are immediate sisters, and C is actually sister to A plus B, a completely different topology, right? And then we test the posterior probability for that species tree using, uh, you know, the, the coalescent probabilities for all your genes, right? So similarly, we test all possible species tree hypothesis and come up with the one that has the most posterior probability using in a typical Bayesian framework, right? So if you guys have used Mr. Bayes or Beast or Star Beast, like what we did yesterday, uh, these programs use use a you know Markov chain Monte Carlo method to traverse probability space and come up with the hypothesis with the highest posterior probability, right? And in this case, our hypothesis is species tree, right? So we go over various topologies or various species trees and figure out which one has the most post best posterior probability, given that this is our uh, data set and these are the gene trees that we have. Yeah, much clearer now. Yeah. Okay, great. I mean, you always have the, uh, you know, the option of going back through these slides and looking at this video again and reading other material also. This will, give, this will get much clearer. Don't really worry about this. So I just took this opportunity to, you know, explain the coalescent, uh, in, you know, I've tried to make it as palatable as possible uh, because otherwise, you know, those, those research papers are, are, are hideously complex. I just try to condense it and make it uh, palatable. <clears throat> okay, moving on in the interest of time. <clears throat> um, so we are done with the coalescent and with uh, birth and death, right? So the fundamental point uh, or the most important point here is that all these tools use the birth death model to discern interspecific divergence. And all these models use the coalescent to discern intraspecific divergence. Right now, let me just explain this uh, once that we're all on the same page with the phylogeny. Right? Um, sorry about that. Let's see. So remember that I was saying that all species delimitation tools subject your phylogeny or ultrametric tree to both models, right? So your phylogeny is something like this, and it will run through the birth death model, and it will have it will get probabilities for all of the probabilities for each of these nodes in your phylogeny to be speciation events, right? Similarly, it will run the same phylogeny or the ultrametric tree through the coalescent model and get probability for coalescence for each of these nodes, right? But as you can see with the coalescent, what happens is the closer the alleles are, the higher the probability of coalescence, right? Similarly, for the birth death model, which is a divergence model, the closer the alleles are, the lesser the probability that this represents a species level uh, 
split or this node represents a speciation event right so you run your phylogeny through both models and for each node you decipher the birth death probability and the coalescent probability and you find the inflection point or the line like here and figure out which nodes are better explained by coalescence and therefore represent intraspecific divergence and which nodes are better explained by the birth rate model and therefore represent interspecific uh, diversification right is this clear so this is the point we were all trying to get at yeah <clears throat> yeah so for instance, a, a node sorry yeah. a node over here right so deep in the phylogeny it will have a much higher probability with the birth rate model with the coalescent model it will have a much lower probability because the probability of uh, the divergence time is much higher here right so as simple as that so now the program will decipher that okay it has a much better probability here with birth rate so this has to be a speciation event and not inter intra specific divergence right okay so this Excuse my laptop, it's very slow. Okay, now, uh, most modern day species delimitation uh, papers or, 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 or uh, research, uh, it involves a two pronged approach, right? All, all uh, self respecting species delimitation papers. Uh, what they do is they, they use a discovery approach followed by a validation approach. And these are really simple concepts. Now, the discovery approach is very simple. Where you just throw your data set. When I say data set, I mean alignments of multiple uh, genes. You throw that data set at a species discovery tool. And the species discovery tool will basically give you the number of species in your data set. Right? Very simple. So what it does is it's basically mining the number of species in your data set and telling you that there are 10 species or 12 species or 14 species. Right? But the species validation approach is taking those uh those discovery the, the hypothesis that the discovery approaches are thrown at you right for example you could be using gmyc which tells you there are 10 species then you could be using bptb which which probably tells you there are 14 species and abgd tells you there are 15 right so now you have three different species hypothesis or uh, species delimitation hypothesis you can test all these three species delimitation hypothesis using a species validation approach okay and species validation is done by programs like bbp which we will see later and other programs like speed stem and abc okay so the discovery approaches give you different hypotheses which can actually be validated using some of these other tools like bpp and abc is that clear <clears throat> so if you look at this uh, this chart i mean this diagram uh, figure is from salter et al and i've shared this paper with you guys uh, they use a discover they, they use four dif distinct discovery approaches to come up with the number of species right and they use two validation approaches to validate what the discovery uh, approaches have given them. Uh, and they also use a chimeric uh, approach, which is basically a combination of discovery and validation. Okay? So when you're, you're doing species delimitation for your group of organisms, it's prudent to use many discovery approaches, come with multiple species hypothesis, and then run those hypotheses through uh, species validation tools so that you have a clear idea of, of how many species you have. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so now we'll start looking at some of the tools and th these are actually pretty uh, straightforward. We won't spend too much time. Uh, so the first tool I'm going to talk about is GMYC, which is the General Mixed Yule Coalescent. As the name suggests, it uses the Yule model to decipher interspecific uh, divergence and it uses the coalescent to decipher intraspecific divergence, right? Very simple. The GMYC takes in... Uh, uh, an ultrametric tree, uh, which is built using a single locus, right? Which means a, a ultrametric gene tree. Right? You have to be very careful not to concatenate two genes uh, before using GMYC. Um, and <clears throat> like we said, it, GMYC figures out the inflection point between interspecific and intraspecific uh, divergences using the dual coalescent uh, models. And it also gives you a certain confidence interval of how sure it is of this inflection point, right? So it's basically saying that this is the mean inflection point, this dotted line, 
and the gray area here is my confidence interval right the inflection could be anywhere from here to here and based on this confidence interval the number of species in your phylogeny could change right so these are some things you should have to keep in mind when using gmyc um uh, <clears throat> yeah otherwise it's a very simplistic model right uh, so let's jump straight to that tool and i can quickly show you how gmyc works Okay, I'm trying to share a different screen. So I'm going to stop presenting and start over. <clears throat> okay, so this is the web interface. Uh, can you guys see this new screen here? It's still low. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. great. So this is the web interface for GMYC, right? So the input is an ultrametric tree. Uh, in NEVIC format and I already have one so I'm going to use that ultrametric tree and I've shared this ultrametric tree with you guys so I'm choosing an ultrametric tree basically the same Dravido Gecko data set that we used yesterday and this is only uh, built using the ND2 gene right it's not a concatenated ultrametric tree and I'm using a single threshold method uh, versus a multiple threshold so basically the difference is a single threshold will give you a single inflection point on the phylogeny, which differentiates uh, inter and intra specific divergences. Right? Multiple threshold will give you two uh, inflections, and you can choose whichever inflection you want. So let's just go with a single threshold. And I also give my email address and I just click on submit. Right? Oh, it's already finished, uh, which is strange. So I'm just going to download the output. <clears throat> so it's very difficult to uh, see this. So I'm going to uh, zoom in. So can you guys see this now? This is the output of GMYC, right? So here it is drawn an inflection point on my lineages through time plot and says that everything after the red line is basically intraspecific divergence and everything before the red line is interspecific, right? So that's what GMYC has given for my data set. And this is some likelihood graph. Uh, I'm not going to bother with this. And this is the tree. Okay, I'm going to increase the size a little more. So, you can see. so this is basically the uh, species delimited tree that it's thrown back at me, right? And here, what it's basically telling me that the two individuals from Moonar that I sampled belong to the same species, which is represented by red, by, by red branches on that clay, right? Similarly, the two individuals I uh, sequenced from Kodekanal represent the same species, again represented by red. Similarly, for Vyanard. However, look at Valpare, right? The two individuals uh, I sequenced from Valpare, GMYC is telling me these are actually two different species represented by. Uh, uh, you know, black branches on this clay, right? So that is how this tree has to be interpreted. So if it gives you red branches, it's telling you that these are the same species. If it gives you black branches in the clay, it's telling you that these two individuals could potentially be distinct species, right? <clears throat> Everyone with me? But however, I mean, I know that these two individuals cannot be different species because we caught them from the same wall in Valpare. And Roy was also there with me when we were sampling. So, you know, intuitively, I know that they're not distinct species, but they do, they do show some kind of genetic structure. So that's the reason GMYC is showing uh, that, you know, these two individuals are distinct species, right? Okay. Hey, Chaitanya, now, can you uh, just uh, put the web address on the chat box? It's, it's, there, the okay. it's there in the presentation. Okay. okay. It's already there. Okay. How you feed the data in this GMYC? Sorry, can you say that again? How you feed the data in this uh, software? Oh, I just uh, showed you, I thought. Okay. It, it, it's a web interface and you just basically, uh, it asks you to choose a file. And you just uh, pick the file and you 
input it that's okay. all okay yeah you, you use a new wick format and uh, i think uh, yesterday or day before we showed you how to actually save your ultrametric tree as a new wick format yes uh, using pic tree yeah yeah give me a bit my laptop is acting up slightly okay Okay, so the next tool is uh, BPTP, which again uh, is very similar to GMYC, but the only difference is that BPTP uses branch lengths on on a phylogeny as opposed to ages on an ultrametric on a dated uh, or a or a time calibrated tree, right? So the input to BPTP is uh, like a like a phylogeny. Uh, and it uses branch lengths to kind of decipher inter and intra specific divergence. Rest of it is the same as GMYC, so I'm not going to go into that. But I can still show you how this works. Um, <clears throat> I'll have to stop sharing and start again. Oh God. Give me a second. So Jaitanya, uh, just uh, uh, so in case of BPTP, it's also again using Yule process and um, coalescence uh, to uh, determine the inflection point. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so this again is very similar, uh, very similar web interface to GMYC. Uh, Archana, if you can follow, this is exactly how we did it for GMYC also while selecting, right? So we choose a file. And once we click on choose files, it, it gives you the option of choosing a file from your laptop. And you just input that file. I've chosen a phylogram as opposed to uh, the, an ultrametric tree. My tree is rooted, so I'm going to say rooted number of generations is 10,000 is fine. So they, these helpful fellows actually tell you that if you have less than 50 taxa, then, you know, 100,000 generations is usually enough to run the NCNCJ, right? Uh, thinning is uh, 100. I mean, it's not worry about that. Burn-in is basically 0.1 of all your trees and it picks a random seed. If I have outgroups in my tree, it is absolutely important to mention the outgroups <clears throat> so that the, the process eliminates or, or does not account for the outgroups. Because once your outgroups are considered as part of your of your analysis, then the species elimination softwares will go for a toss. Yeah. Uh, so also for a phylogram, you can't have polytons, right? Yeah. Right. It's assumed that you don't have uh, polytomies, and your uh, phylogeny is pretty well resolved. Yeah. I'll just uh, enter my email address and submit. Right. So, and this usually takes about a minute or two to run. Uh, so if you guys have any questions, you can shoot them now. So I just wanted to uh, sort of uh, add to what Chaitanya has been talking about. Uh, all these methods, you know, use a very simple logic, and and the, the logic is that within species variation is or intraspecific variation is less than interspecific variation, or within species variation is less than between species variation, and these programs are then trying to figure out, you know, where is that transition in the phylogeny uh, between uh interspecific variation and intraspecific variation so uh, and they basically use all those tricks to figure that out yeah so now we uh, so pptp has given us uh, a delimited uh, species tree uh, or, a, or a species delimitation model right uh, so again just like gmyc it tells you that the red clades are single species the blue ones are distinct and again, BPTP is again split the two individuals from Valparais as two distinct species with a very high probability. 
saying that these two individuals are most likely distinct species. But we know that they're not. But this is what these tools usually do. And this is why these tools have to be used with utmost caution. Right? Uh, if you're an irresponsible taxonomist, you'd be happy to just describe uh, one more species here. As opposed to just uh, uh, and Jaitanya, could you uh, just uh, interpret this uh, the result and let pe people know how many species uh, there are? Sure, I mean, sure, uh, sure. According to B uh, BPTP. Yeah. So according mm -hmm. to BPTP, if you just go by the tree, right? So it's telling you that KMTR. It is the the possibility that the sample from KMTR is a distinct species is is one. So KMTR is definitely a new species says right or a distinct species uh, the possibility that the individuals from ponmudi or the probability that ponmudi is a, is a distinct species is 0.92 and the probability that the individuals from ponmudi are distinct from each other at a species level is 0 0.08 which means the ponmudi animals are the same right they're not distinct species that's how we infer this tree and similarly from megamala you see that you know there's a high probability that they represent the same species why not the same? But Valpara, it says these two lineages could represent distinct species. Uh, and so basically, this uh, tree tells me that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight species. Right? Is that clear? That's what I wanted you to just go over. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So this tree tells me that there are eight species in my in my data set. Okay. So whether you want to take this at face value or not is completely left to you. And the viewers to accept your hypothesis. Okay, uh, let me just quickly gallop through the few more slides that we have. Okay, back to the slide, right? <clears throat> okay. Uh, this is not moving. Okay, so the, uh, the the last tool we're going to we're going to look at, which is a much more comprehensive tool than GMYC or B, BPTP, is this tool called Bayesian phylogenetics and phylogeography. Right. So this tool uses a multi-species coalescent model, uh, and multi-species coalescent is what we just saw that uh, you know uh, hideously arduous uh, uh, model that we saw some time ago. So this tool uses that model and it uses it in a Bayesian framework to do species hypothesis validation, okay, primarily. It can also delimit species or discover a uh, number of species in your data set, but most uh, papers or most uh, most research uses BPP to, you know, validate species hypothesis. So like we said, it, uh, like we discussed during that coalescent uh, section, uh, BPP infers population sizes and divergence times, right? Uh, so the input to BPP will be a multi-locus sequence data. So this is opposed to GMYC and BPTP that take in uh, an ultrametric tree based built based on a single locus, or in the case of BPTP, a phylogeny built using a single locus, right? But BPP has the ability to take in multi-locus sequence data. In the sense, you can have four mitochondrial genes and five nuclear genes in your data set. And input that to BPP, and BPP will still, you know, you uh, work correctly. We'll see how, right? It's a pretty cool tool to use, though it's not as straightforward as GMYC or BPT, uh, right? So the way BPP works is it, it evaluates speciation models by collapsing or retaining nodes in what's called a guide tree. Okay, so here in the input, along with the multi-local sequence data, we also give BPP a guide tree. So the guide tree here is a representation of uh, the real relationships amongst the organisms that you have. Okay, basically a species tree. So you input the guide tree in the format of uh, in the NIVIC format uh, to BPP. So what BPP will then do is it, it will evaluate speciation models by collapsing or retaining nodes on the guide tree that you have specified. To give you an example. Let's say I've given a guide tree that looks like this in the bottom, right? So I've given this uh, phylogeny here, where I say that one and two are immediately related, and three is related to uh, the clade one and two, 
and four and five are sisters and they are they are you know sister to clade one two and three so this is the phylogeny that i've input to bpp now bpp will first estimate the possibility that each of these lineages represent distinct species okay to be more precise it will estimate the probability that probability of each node in the phylogeny representing a species level split okay or a speciation event next what it will do is it will merge a couple of nodes right let's say here it's merged four and five into a single lineage right and then it will re-evaluate re the possibility of a of a four species model here right similarly it can also collapse one and two and re-evaluate the possibility of another four species model and it can do the same for a three species model a two species model and a single species model which is basically assuming that all the organisms you have represent one species right so this is how bpp basically collapses nodes from your guide tree to evaluate uh, uh, your speciation models right so it is very it's basically trivial to infer that if you input bpp a five species model it is going to evaluate four three two and one okay it is not going to evaluate six or seven or eight right so it, it is it's basically obvious that if you think you have 10 species in your group group right let's say the species discovery tools have given you 10 species in your group you uh, give bpp a 15 species model right because it can it can evaluate models uh, with lesser number of species from what you give it but it can't do the reverse is that clear so that's one of the things that uh, we all should remember with bpp when using bpp <coughs> thank you okay okay so i'll quickly show you how bpp works and we will uh, then move on to the last slide of the presentation uh, which is the most important slide in my mind uh, just give me a bit I, I think I should just share the whole window instead of doing this. Whole screen here. Okay, while Chaitanya is trying to get it to work, uh, I just wanted to point out that uh, these uh, species delimitation tools um, or speciation models uh, make some fundamental. Uh, uh, assumptions which are highly sort of uh, unrealistic, right? And therefore, you should not take uh, these results uh, at the face value. And what are these unrealistic assumptions that they make? Uh, one is that speciation is instantaneous. Uh, and the other assumption is that within species, there is no uh, population structure. Now, both of these assumptions are unrealistic. Right. So often uh, these methods tend to over split uh, and therefore it is a good idea to, you know, have a validation tool followed by multiple lines of evidence. Yeah. So, so that's the last slide. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank, I, you, I'll share Thank you for stealing my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> no issues, no issues. So, okay. So I'm just going to quickly show you how BPP works. So uh, can you all see my command line screen? Uh, no, your uh, the screen no. is not shared. Oh, oops. Sorry about that. What am I doing? Now? Yeah, yeah it's good. Yeah. yeah, it's good. Great, great. Okay. So I'm just going to invoke... Uh, okay, before I invoke BPP, so uh, if you look at your practicals folder day four and go into BPP 3.4 a you see that there are three executables, right? All three do the same thing. Some of them work on 64-bit uh, mode. Some of them work on 32-bit. So just play around and see which one works on your computer. I don't know which one is for which. So whichever works for your computer, it's, it's great because the, the code base is basically the same. So 
BPP takes in uh, a control file as input. Okay, so let me show, show you a sample control file. And basically, the control file is the karta of your analysis. It basically determines how good or bad your analysis is. So let me open a sample control file. <clears throat> so this control file, you remember we did uh, GMYC and BPTP delimitation on the Dravido Gecko data set. And both tools told us that there are eight species, right? Uh, from seven dis distinct localities and from Valpara, it told us that two individuals are two distinct species. So I'm going to basically test that eight species hypothesis and validate it using BPP. Okay. And the control file for that I have built like this. Okay. This is how the control file looks. I'm not going to go through all the options here, but some of the important ones I'll go through. <clears throat> so this is my sequence file, right? Uh, it's, it's basically where my... Uh, all, I, I've used three Can you just increase the font a bit? Sure. That good? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so on the sequence file, I have basically all my three alignments. Uh, alignments for all three genes. I'm using ND2, RAG1, and a gene called PDC, which is also a nuclear gene, right? So I provide all three alignments in my uh, sequence file. The sequence file is also shared with you guys. You guys can go take a look at it later. And then there's something called the IMAP file. Okay. I'll show you what the IMAP file is uh, eventually. And then you tell BPP where the output should go. Here I'm telling BPP that it should go to out8.txt just to uh, remind me that it's the eight species hypothesis. And it also throws the NCMC output into a, a separate file, which I can specify, right? Now, I'll quickly show you the sequence file and the IMAP file, okay? So the sequence file is over here. Let me open this with the word bag. It will be more legible that way. <clears throat> so this is my first gene, okay? It starts here. I'm going to increase the font size again. Okay, so this is my first gene. I'm saying in the first alignment, I have 13 individuals and 1041 base pairs. Okay, so this is the ND2 gene. And I've given it, uh, given each sequence a sequence identifier. So here I'm saying Kodekanal underscore 1 Shapo 6. Okay, my second individual is called Punmudi underscore 1 Shapo 7. So why are, so why am I uh, concatenating my sequence name with this? cap 6 or cap 5, right? All my sequences are concatenated with something. Here it's cap 51, right? And here I'm saying cap 1 for Valpara, cap 11, etc. So all my sequences have to have a cap in the name or a shako followed by some number or it could even be a like a like text, it could be A, B or C or whatever. I just use numbers for ease of use. Now we'll see why we use these numbers, right? So there's another file called the IMAP file, which we specified in our, this is the control file. We specify something called the IMAP file, right? So the, the cap business actually comes into play here. So when I open the IMAP file, it's a very straightforward file, right? Let me increase the... So what I'm saying is, if you, if, what I'm telling BPP is if you see one after the cap, treat it as species A. If you see 11 after the cap in the sequence, treat it as species A1. If you see 21 after the cap, treat it as species B. And if you see 71, treat it as species G and so on and so forth, right? So basically what I'm doing is I'm mapping my sequences with my putative species or the species validation that I want to do. Here, as you see, I'm trying to validate eight species. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight species, right? And these uh, numbers that are after the caps in my sequence file, they map my sequences with the respective species, right? Simple enough. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> right, we're done with this. Now, BPP can do both species delimitation and species tree analysis, right? For this particular analysis, we don't care about species trees. We only want to want it to do species delimitation. It really does not delimit species. It actually does species hypothesis validation, right? 
so we'll leave species delimitation uncommented and we'll comment the species tree uh, instructions here right? that's what we're doing uh, you can figure out these uh, uh, these parameters in the BPP documentation, I'm not going to go through them, otherwise we'll be here all night. Um, <clears throat> then, um, <clears throat> the species model prior, I give it a, uh, uh, I give it a uniform prior. You can also check this out in the documentation. It's, it's actually fairly straightforward. Uniform priors actually work best for the kind of organisms that at least I work with. And uh, the species entry parameter, so, for the, so the first input you tell uh, tell BPP is how many species you think there are. Okay, so you're telling BPP here that I think there are eight species that are called A, A1, B, C, D, E, F, and G, right? And here I tell BPP how many sequences of each species I have in my data set, right? Or how many individuals per species I have. Uh, it could be across various genes, right? So I'm saying for A, I have only one individual. Whereas for C, I have two, and for E, I have two, and so on and so forth, <clears throat> right? Next, I input BPP, like we spoke about the guide tree during the presentation, right? So we input the guide tree to BPP, and this is basically a guide tree or a species tree in NEVIC format, uh, and this is what we think the right relationships between our organisms are. So here, what I'm saying is, I, I'm saying that A and A1 are sisters, and these two are basically sister to B and uh, you know, A, A1, B is sister to the clade which is made up of D, E and C and so on, right? So this is basically, are all of you familiar with the NEVIC format and how to, how to uh, convert a phylogeny into NEVIC? Yeah, I think Roy showed that. Uh, well, yeah, I think he did, no? Uh, yeah, I mean, in the previous workshop, but in any case, uh, if, if they just look at the NEVIC format, uh, that they create using Fictory, they should be able to figure it out. Yeah, yeah. And you can use Fictory to convert your phylogeny into Nevik and Nevik into phylogeny. So it's, it's really cool that way, right? Anyway, so the next parameter is this parameter called diploid. But actually this parameter is a little, it's a misnomer, it's, it's misleading. Because I'm basically telling BPP here that all my sequences are unfaced, okay? So uh, what do I mean by faced and unfaced sequences? So unfaced sequences uh, effectively don't have uh, ambiguity codes in them, uh, but phased ones do, right? So if you input phased sequences to BPP, it will try out every possibility for the ambiguity code, right? For example, if there is Y at a certain site uh, in, your, in your sequence, the Y could be an A or a C, right? And BPP will evaluate the possibility of that allele having an A at that site and a C at that site. If you give it phased sequences, but because my sequences are unfaced, I just say one uh, and indicate to BPP that you don't have to worry about ambiguous sites. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Again, I'm assuming that all of you are familiar with IUPAC codes, ambiguity codes, and so on. Okay. It's not just look it up; it's very straightforward. <clears throat> okay. Um, now let's go to the most two most important parameters, the theta prior and the tau prior, right? So these, this is basically the population uh, prior that we have to, we could specify to BPP, right? Here I'm <clears throat> telling that the population ancestral, effective ancestral population size prior should follow an inverse gamma distribution with three as the alpha parameter and 0 0.02 as the beta parameter. And this is how the theta prior is in the end estimated, right? This is the mean for the theta prior. So it is basically beta divided by alpha minus one. So this is the mean. So what does this mean? What does this actually uh, represent? So I'm telling this program that if I pick any two individuals randomly from the same population, they have a P distance or uncorrected P distance of 0 0.001, right? So that is what this represents. So if this holds true for your data, then you can use the same prior that I have used. Okay, basically this is a sequence divergence of 0.1% bet, uh, between two organisms in, in the same, or two individuals from the same population, right? But if your organisms have a larger intraspecific divergence, then you will probably have to increase your beta parameter here. Is that clear? 
This is a very, very important parameter. It could make or break your analysis. I've seen a lot of people use random. Uh, but Chaitanya, uh, yeah. just so this is when you're in, when you're using a concatenated data set. Oh, yes, very important point. So this is so this the one of the problems with BPP is that it assumes that this is the random mean divergence between two individuals for any gene. Right. So if I'm using a mitochondrial gene and two nuclear genes, I would pick the divergence in the nuclear genes because that is lower. Right. So it's a good idea to uh, to give a very low mean for both the theta prior and the top prior and let the program kind of uh, figure it out as opposed to giving it a very high mean uh, along with it. Is that clear, Roy? Yeah, yeah. But so, so yeah, now it's clear. So it doesn't use the value that you give absolutely. It's no, no, still, it's a distribution. It, it still, yeah, hovers around it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, it is a, it's okay. a distribution. It's an inverse, okay. inverse gamma distribution okay. with as the mean, right? And it's better to have a small mean. And the same principle applies applies to the top prior, which is the divergence uh, times, right? The prior for divergence times. Okay, so let's go further down. And all of these are very simple to figure out. Okay, here is an important thing. Here is a parameter called heredity. Okay, so what I've done is I've specified heredity, uh, the heredity parameter using another file called heredity.txt. <clears throat> now, what does heredity do? So heredity basically explicitly mentions the ploidy of the three loci that you've used right so let me open that heredity text <clears throat> so as you can see the heredity text basically consists of three numbers right my first the first gene in my data set is a, is a mitochondrial gene, right? So I'm eff effectively telling BPP that the effective ancestor, effective population size for my first locus should be one fourth of the ancestral population sizes, right? And my next two genes are autosomal genes. So I'm telling BPP that take the ancestral population sizes at face value for the next two loci that I have in my data set. Right. So BPP basically uses these three numbers to calculate effective ancestral population sizes for all three loci and therefore builds gene trees like how we saw uh, in the coalescent presentation. Right. This is a very important thing. If you mess this up, then your uh, species tree could go completely wrong because it, your ancestral population sizes will be skewed. Right. So when it is a mitochondrial gene, specify 0.25. When it is a, y chrom a gene from the Y chromosome, again, specify 0.25. And when it is an autosomal, you specify one, right? <clears throat> cool. Um, so that's that with the control file. Now let's just input, and now I'm also giving NCMC parameters. I'm saying, you know, the burden is the first 4,000 trees, and I'll sample every 20,000 trees, okay? So let's, let's just run this program and take questions while this runs, yeah? <clears throat> So I'm basically going to copy this address and change it this year. Right. So then I say BPP underscore. So the input to the BPP program, like I said, is the control file. And remember your heredity file, your map file, and your sequence file should be in the same folder as your control file. And preferably all these things should be in the same folder to avoid any kind of confusion, right? So I'm going to input the control file, which is this and oops. <clears throat> right. And I press enter and BPP starts analyzing it. <clears throat> right. Okay. So while this happens, um, I can actually show you the output of this uh, there's a file called out seven <clears throat> oh it's just basically building out seven okay <clears throat> 
you chose out 8 i think yeah 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 i chose out 8 it's just building that okay now uh, so this is going to take a bit to uh, finish so let me show you a sample output okay uh, this is this is the sample output for my seven species hypothesis which i have run before so as you can see it first lists out all the like all my sequences and then just scroll to the bottom uh, and the brought the bottom of this file is basically the business end where <clears throat> you see that it gives you this guide tree with posterior probability at each node right i want to increase the font a little bit Uh, you can do control plus okay this is better no yeah okay so if you look at this guide tree here what bpp is telling me is that for species pair d and e it is 0.99 it's it's given me a, a posterior probability of 0.99 which means it's absolutely sh almost sure that d the node that splits d and e represents a speciation event right so that's how you interpret this similarly the node that represents the split between c and d plus e the probability that that represents a speciation event is 1 <clears throat> right and for a and b the probability is posterior probability is 0.97 so basically it gives you the posterior probability for nodes representing speciation events right so that is how this tree has to be interpreted okay um if you look at this uh, summary <clears throat> these are the various uh, models that bpp has tested for that analysis right and for each of these models it assigns a prior so the way you interpret this model is here bpp assumes that there is only one species uh, sorry uh, yeah no species at all and it gives and it gets a posterior of zero i don't know why it really does that and the second model assumes that a uh i mean there is just one species in my entire data set and the posterior probability for that also is zero and then it assumes that uh the first node which is between d and e and the last node which is between f and g represent uh uh speciation events and the probability for that also is very bad now <clears throat> if you look at the model number 15 it says all six ancestral nodes uh the hypothesis is that all six ancestral nodes represent speciation events which means if there are six ancestral nodes there are seven species correct so it's basically saying there is a seven there are seven species in your data set and the posterior probability for all of that is 0.97 is that clear yes uh, but you uh, you started with eight right you told bpp that the oh, yeah yeah but but the uh, eight species that, that's still running so in the interest of time i'm showing the seven species yeah 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 so but you you gave you told B, bpp that you know uh, there are pro probably eight species you know and let, let me know how many there really are and and it comes up with seven right no 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 this this output is for the seven species run it's not oh, for eight okay while the eight okay, species okay, okay. i am just showing the output for the seven species one right okay okay so if you think there are seven distinct lineages that represent seven distinct species there will be six internal nodes right so bpp basically tells you which of those internal nodes represent a speciation event and which node does not and the numbers here are representative of those internal nodes here it is saying node number 6 does not represent a speciation event but node num nodes 1 to 5 represents speciation events and the probability for that again is zero right but for all six nodes to represent speciation events the probability is very high it's 0.97 so we can be fairly confident that we have seven species in our hand right <clears throat> and it is also given by this guide tree you know just so that you can so if you want to visualize this guide tree using let's say fig tree you can just input this to fig tree right however just to make your life harder uh nuvik format uses colon and these fellows use uh, uh, hash so we just have to change all this to colon so that it's in uh, standard nuvik format this all this is just to make your life harder and waste your time but we have to go by it but i'm not complaining because all the software is free right i don't have any right to complain <clears throat> 
Hey, so, so uh, Chaitanya, just generally uh, query. So, yeah. uh, so does it really matter? So that in the 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 value that you put as point one percent uh, of in, intra species divergence. Ah. Say I put it as zero. Will it still give me the uh, the same number of species? Have it write it out, or uh, will it inflate the number of species? So uh, I'm I have not really tried it out, but in the BPP forums they keep telling you that uh, changing the ancestral I mean the, the the prior for ancestral population sizes or theta uh, drastically affects uh, uh, the number of species. Okay, right. so if you want to uh, inflate the number of species, then you can do it. Yeah, in your paper, if you just don't mention your theta prior, and you just say BPP gave me twenty-five species, and you go and describe all those twenty-five species happily. Dangerous. Yeah, it's it's extremely dangerous, and we'll get to that in the last slide of the presentation. So I'm just going to show you how uh, this mimic can be converted. Just give me a bit. So I'm opening fig tree basically. So one doubt I had, Shetanya here. Yeah. Yeah, this prior showed this uh, 0 0.06667 value. Why is that? From where did that value come? Which one? Oh, oh, oh it assigns a constant prior for all possible species models. Okay. So it just ensures that the prior, the prior probability for each model is constant, right? And using this constant prior and the likelihood for each model, it calculates the posterior probability for each species model. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I guess the assumption is that you know a priori you don't know how many species there are, so you place equal probability for the different speciation models. Yeah. Okay. So got it. Yeah. Okay. Can all of you see the fig tree screen? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to paste the uh, Newick format. Uh, Results from BBP here. Oh God. Clipboard contains. Uh, uh, Chaitanya, I think there's one bracket missing towards the, the right end. Really? No. Yeah, just just look at it. No, the, after uh, 1000 zero, 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 and uh, no, semicolon. That should, outside, uh, that should be outside the bracket. That should be outside the bracket, huh? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's try it. Okay, there you go. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So I'm just going to increase the tip labels. <clears throat> so basically, it tells me that this this is my species delimitation. Uh, I can also do align tip labels so that or or not. And in my node labels, it will give me posterior probability for each node. Oops. Or oh, it's completely not. Okay, uh, it somehow is using branch lens for it. Uh, let me increase the size. So it gives you posterior probability for each of these nodes representing a speciation event, right? And these posterior probabilities basically come from uh, what BPP has discerned over here, right? So this is how you infer, uh, you look at a, like, uh, visualize a BPP delimitation analysis. <clears throat> Cool. Uh, so that was BPP, and it's a slightly complicated tool. And if you, but if you spend enough time with it, uh, you can get really good at it, and you can do like lots of fancy stuff with it, right? Uh, it's complicated, but very cool. Okay. Uh, any questions? Uh, we just have one more slide to go, and then we are done. Jitanya, go ahead with your last slide and then we can take questions. Okay. So this is the last slide. These are basically points to ponder. Okay. Uh, so, well, we saw that GMYC and PPTP tools like that tend to oversplit. Okay. So if you, if you think there are seven species, GM, BPTP will sometimes come and tell you there are 17. And I'm not, not kidding you. Right. I've seen this in various data sets. Right. Uh, one way to mitigate this problem is have multiple samples from each population. And that way you can control... Uh, BPTP and GMYC from going overboard. Uh, 
uh, you have to remove outgroups before running GMYC in BPTP, or you could specify outgroups in uh, when, when it asks you to. Uh, if you don't specify outgroups, what uh, will happen is these tools will just delimit two groups, right? Your in-group will become one species and your out-group will become a completely different species. Because your out-group is gen gen generally genetically quite divergent from your in-group, right? <clears throat> so if you have a bunch of monkeys in your in-group and if you use a cow as an out-group, uh, BPTP and GMYC will tell you there are two species, right? It will tell you all monkeys are one species and cow is uh, the second species. So remove your out-group from your phylogeny before you run these tools. Uh, <clears throat> BPP requires sufficient sampling and sufficient independent loci since it's a coalescent method. And the most important point is that BPP relies very heavily on the accuracy of the guide tree. So if you're not sure of your species tree, uh, which represents the organisms that you have, then BPP might not be a great idea. <clears throat> or if you think there are two or three different uh, uh, phylogenies equally likely, then you might want to rerun BPP with all three phylogenies represented as guide trees yeah uh, so that you you get some kind of uh, uh, consensus um, so bpp as we spoke can check for overestimation of species but it cannot check for underestimation so it's better you already overestimate uh, the number of species so bpp can evaluate all possibilities and how do you overestimate you just run your data set through gmyc or bptp it will already give you an overestimated version so just run those hypotheses through BPP and it'll probably, you'll probably get uh, a, a decently accurate story, right? <clears throat> okay, so a couple of things on highlight uh, about the bottom line of uh, this whole uh, presentation. So when in doubt, it is always prudent to underestimate diversity than to overestimate it, right? And uh, so what I mean is you, you it's, it's okay to be conservative with the number of species you're delimiting. And because that is way better than, uh, you know, authoring potential synonyms in the future, right? Someone else will come three years down the line and sink your species. So it's better to be conservative right now and, and save face rather than author potential synonyms, right? <clears throat> so that's just my opinion. But if you want to go ahead and describe as many, go for it, right? Uh, the most important point of this presentation is that none of these tools actually delimit species, like we saw on the first slide. All these tools, like Praveen was mentioning uh, like a little while ago, all these tools only delimit genetic structure. They can diagnose genetic structure within, within different populations. And that is what, in turn, we start interpreting as distinct species. Now, <clears throat> this could be very misleading and very wrong, right? Because the, the, the semantics of the word species uh, has a more holistic meaning than just genetic structure, right? We are looking at ecological divergence, morphological divergence, uh, we're looking at behavioral differences, so on and so forth. So all of these things uh, quantify what uh, a species really is and not just genetic structure. So the most important takeaway message here is that when you're de delimiting species, don't just use molecular data. Use Try and use as many other lines of independent evidence, right? Uh, I've seen papers where they say, Oh, these two species are morphologically very similar, but genetically they're very different, right? Uh, now that's those. Now you're not using two independent lines of evidence there. You, you're using only one line of evidence, right? And and uh, so on and so forth. So try and use as many independent lines of evidence, and definitely delimiting genetic structure is one of them, but it is only one of them, right? Yes. So that's the end of that long presentation. Thank you for hearing. And if there are any questions, we'll take it now. <clears throat> yeah, so if there any... Word, sorry. Yeah, uh, sure. yeah, uh, I was just I wanted to comment on his email address. It's something different. <laughs> but let's get to the questions. <laughs> yeah, so actually, if there are any burning questions, like uh, life and death related, you can ask now. Otherwise, uh, we'll always be there on the WhatsApp. It's birth and death. <laughs> uh, birth and death. Birth and death. So basically, Praveen, uh, when I was really young, uh, the internet had just come, right? I was in college at that time. And we had the single email provider called Lycos.com. I'm sure you remember Lycos.com, right? Mm -hmm. And because I was heavily influenced by the doors, my email ID was mojo rising at Lycos.com. 
By the time I migrated to Google, Mozo Rising was already 